As I mentioned, uh, Scott actually introduced me to Kip. I don't know if we've ever the three of us been in the same room together. Um, but, uh, but a while back, when I was actually starting Capital Factory, and I was looking for other uh, mentors to help join it, um, uh, Kip was the first person out that I didn't know already that became a mentor. Um, and, and through through Scott's uh, recommendation, and Kip is a uh, like five or six times serial entrepreneur. He's created hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, in value through the companies that he's made. Uh, so he's been he's an entrepreneur that's been beginning starting companies and, and sold them. Uh, technically, if you uh, if you line everything up right, or if you, you line line up the description right, I believe he sold one of his companies to Bob. Does that kind of yeah. work, work out in the end, right? I don't know if Bob was speaking. I don't know if Bob was there at the time. Or like a couple like degrees of separation. Yeah, uh, one of the companies that he created that got bought by another company that got by, that got bought by three count or something like that. Um, and uh, and uh, as a, a, what I seems to be a little known fact that I, that I just didn't know likes to bring up. He also was one of the first employees at Dell um, as a as a high school student. So um, so he should have stayed. Yeah, the poster child for not going to college. Yeah. So anyway, so um, Kip uh, is, uh, now he's a, a venture capitalist. He's gone to the dark side with uh, Silverton Partners, which is uh, one of, in, a, in the realm of VC firms, probably a smaller firm, meaning a smaller fund, which still means tens of millions of dollars, lots of money. But, um, and they're based here in Austin, and they primarily invest in Austin companies. And um, we've invested in lots of companies together, and they're, he's recently invested in he recently invested in another company that <laughs> I'm involved in that, um, that you may have seen. What? That one? Yeah. That yeah, you may have seen. Is, okay, well, okay, so maybe it has me. So you also invested in Jason Cohen's company, which is another company that I helped start with that uh, WP Engine heard from him recently. So uh, in lots of, very active in lots of uh, deals. And he always, he's here to talk about fundraising tonight, and this is one of the topics that he comes and talks to the capital factory companies about too. So, Really glad to have him here tonight. The basic format is we've got about, I think like 10 or 15 slides, and each slide has a question on it. And um, Kip oh, yeah. is going to- uh, Great slides for me, that's awesome. I, yeah, that was, we reviewed the questions before, and I told I, Anyway, so um, <laughs> we've got slides, and uh, we'll throw up the slide. Kip will get up and riff on the slide a little bit, so I'm sure some of his thoughts. And then I'm sure, I would, as is usual, probably uh, Bob and I and Ben, whoever else, may also um, throw in some comments when he's done. And then you guys can ask questions on that particular topic. And then we can kind of move on to the next one and keep it pretty interactive. And I, th I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So um, why don't I real quickly, just because I find with question stuff, this will help people from jumping ahead too much, let me run through what all the questions are so you know what's coming. And then we'll go back to the beginning and, and Kip can start. So what kind of business should raise venture capital? What would you look for if you were funding a student? This is like you asking Kip, what would you look for? It's like, when, how would you give me money? Um, what do I get from investors? Why, you know, why am I doing this to begin with? Obviously money's part of that, but maybe there are other things. What do I give up? What are the trade-offs for taking an investor on? What are the different kinds of venture capital I'd want to take? It's like angel investors and other things. I know, and Ben just actually just posted a blog post about that that uh, hopefully it'll show up on the Facebook group, so he might have some comments there. What's a convertible note? What, how do I decide how much money to raise? How do I meet investors? What role does a lawyer play? How do we get leverage in negotiation with investors? I threw that in one at the end, forget, I don't know if I told them how it was going. But um, uh, what's a term sheet? What's, and then and what's AngelList, which I'll also speak to a little bit. So those are the kind of general topics we had through figuring that um, <coughs> most of you haven't had a lot of experience with this, so we're starting at a pretty high level. So hopefully those sound like good questions to you guys. I'm sure to let you know there'll be another chance to ask more. Okay. And uh, that you know, there. Right. Yeah. And I'll be sliding. All right. Um, thank you for that. Um, and thanks for having me. Uh, so I can briefly give you a little bit of background. This is, how late does the class go? Nine. Nine. You know as long as you. <laughs> <laughs> not, not expected to fill that time. Um, so it's most fun for me uh, if we make this as interactive as possible because it's I can my eyes will roll back in my head and I can soapbox for hours on, on fundraising and whatnot. I'll let me give you a little bit of background about myself so you have some context um, and, and maybe that'll help me. That won't 
Um, then I'm happy to sort of talk through this, but the most fun for sure, and hopefully maybe the most value is to um, throw questions in, uh, get engaged, make it a conversation. That's always a ton more fun. So um, I went to, uh, uh, I've been in Austin 30 years, uh, since, for 30 years. Um, <laughs> I will say that I have felt a lot older than I felt in a long time driving down the speedway where I'm sure it was probably a while ago, but it used to go all the way through campus, and now it doesn't. <laughs> so um, that was a bit of a delay in my getting here. Um, so I did double E here. Um, while I was going to uh, school here, I, went, I, I did Dell, uh, which was called PC's Limit back in the day. Well, I was the fifth employee there. Um, quit, actually, to come to UT, which is why I can't be the poster child for not going to, to college. I quit before they handed out stock options. Um, Went, I did another startup while I was going through UT and then um, started a company called uh, Broad Jump in 1998 uh, that eventually merged, uh, wrapped up to about 100 million bucks in revenue, merged with a company called Motive. Uh, the combination uh, went public in 2004. After the merger in 2002, I went and ran a public company called Tipping Point. That got sold to uh, 3Com, which is a company that Bob started. Um, that was, uh, that was a $460 million acquisition uh, through Tom trying to get back into the large enterprise space, which, which was great. Uh, started a uh, new media company that was interesting, but not financially uh, rewarding, a great learning experience. Uh, and eventually, those outcomes and, and good experiences sort of led, uh, there's another company there called NetSpeed, which got sold to Cisco. I wasn't a founder at, but I was in, in the first five employees, which, um, which is meaningful in terms of how equity gets distributed, which we can talk about if you want. Um, but eventually it led to me doing some angel investing, um, which I thought was a lot of fun because you could work with younger uh, startups. And as I did more and more of that, I kept up into these uh, Silverton guys and eventually made that my full-time gig. And, and now I can't imagine doing anything else. So I have, as Josh said, gone to the dark side and now I'm all venture capital all the time. But I, did, I joined Silverton because they actually have um, a phenomenal uh, attitude towards being entrepreneurially friendly. And, and as much as that's where I started, and I sort of get the trials and tribulations of doing what we're going to talk about tonight, which is raising money, um, finding an investor that has that attitude, whether it's your family, which is kind of predisposed to that attitude, or an angel, which may or may not have that attitude, but, but probably a little bit easier or more venture equity oriented investor where that's harder, um, it's really important to find folks that are aligned with what you want to do and how you want to do it because if there's one thing that's true is you can't fire your investors like you can fire your employees. And so talking through this and getting it the right way um, in your head and, and, and even knowing whether or not you need venture capital um, is important. So, so let's talk about that. Um, so what kind of businesses need venture capital? I think it's an important question because you know, who in here, as part of this, going to this this class, can imagine themselves just for my own identification um, starting a company some someday? Okay, so pretty much everybody. Let's just get. Has anybody started one? They've all started. All. They've all started one. Okay, so by definition, yes. they're in the throes of that. Okay, you may can imagine them doing that for the rest of their lives and sort of the entrepreneurial. All right. So, okay. So. At some point, you're gonna to have to answer this question. So, I think the easiest way to answer this um, boils down to talking about whether or not you want to use other people's money, because magical things happen whether or not you're using your own money, or your family's money, or other people's money. Um, if you bootstrap the company, let's take a half step back for two seconds. Anybody want to venture a guess as to what what the essence of success looks like, what is the one sentence description of success when you're trying to raise money for your company? Anyone? Traction. No, no, not, not what you need in order to raise money, but in the answer. process of raising money, what's success? What is the definition of success? Yeah, getting some? What's that? Getting money? Getting money? Okay, so getting money, what kind of money? A lot of money, a little bit of money? I'll, I'll leave the right amount, amount. Enough money in. <laughs> it's the opposite of that. I think success is defined by raising the least amount, maybe not all investors will say this, 
Success, in my opinion, is defined by raising the least amount of money possible in order to make your business successful. Um, it's an interesting concept because I'm pretty sure most investors can say this, but as an entrepreneur, um, every dollar you take from someone else obligates you to a behavior that may be aligned with your business, may not be aligned with your business. Um, and for sure, if you take, say, hundreds of millions of dollars, your investors want some multiple of that. And so as you take more, the expectation of a particular outcome grows. Um, but when you can raise the least amount possible, if you can raise 200K and make your business successful, the options that you have available to you in terms of exit, the flexibility you have in terms of raising future money, the obligations you have to whoever gave you that 200K are just 10 times easier to deal with than if you take 2 million or 20 million or 200 million. And so, in general, success, in my opinion, is defined by taking the least amount of money possible. And that's an important sort of thing to get in your head. Um, because you may or may not be a business that needs 200K or 20 million. Um, if you want to use other people's money versus your own or your family's, then I think the first thing you sort of commit yourself to is um, deciding whether you firmly stand in a lifestyle-oriented business or a high-growth-oriented <coughs> business. Because if you're using other people's money, they have an expectation of some return on that. And it's usually not the sort of return associated with a laundromat or somebody who paints people's houses, a business that will pay the bills, which is what I call a lifestyle business, but not something that sort of grows and can become a big $100 million, $200 million business uh, over time. And so I think if you have a, an idea, if you have a business that you want, and this isn't just sort of passing an intelligence test, like, well, of course I want to have a big, enormous business. I mean, lifestyle businesses are great. They're, they're, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. High growth, big return, Businesses are much harder to build, but if you take other people's money, you're in general you're obligating yourself to sort of that behavior. And so the first thing, you know, I would say in terms of what kind of businesses should raise venture capital is if you want to go build, if you're if you're ready to go sign up to building a high growth, uh, you know, large revenue, big stinky uh, company over time. It doesn't have to be technology, although that tends to be one of the places that has the most leverage. Um, I don't think, on the other hand, if you wanted to go do a uh, laundromat or a, or a painting business, that that's necessarily a VC-oriented business because of the returns that these VCs expect. Um, does that make sense? So, you know, what else about that? I think, you know, there's a there's a other side of the coin um, sort of discussion, which is a, a, a bit of a rat hole, but it's kind of interesting. Um, Discussion when we talk about venture capital per se, it's always when you when you bootstrap yourself, you're just using money out of your own pocket. You're making your own bets, and you're sort of complicit with yourself. When you're using your family's money, it's not terribly different than that because mom and dad will bet on bet on you. And uh, and if you return a great outcome or you don't, I think that's sort of all in the family. Um, VCs have a particular expectation, um, and how they make money is an important part of that expectation. So does, it, does anybody understand how, how venture capital works and how, how VCs make money? A little bit? It depends on the venture, but basically the way that model is like you invest in 10 companies and eight of, or seven of them die and two of them return their money and one of them makes money. So that's some portfolio theory there. Yeah. Um, so let's, so maybe let's take a couple minutes because the getting that money in the first place and where the VCs raise their money from and sort of what the obligations are and how they actually, you know, if, se if two of them fail and seven of them work, how does a dollar get paid back to who and how? Yeah, let's talk about that for two seconds because I think if, if you get how they work, then I think at the very least you understand a little bit how they're motivated. Um, so typically, a venture capital firm um, goes out to people that they call limited partners and they go raise a fund. And that fund could be 100 million bucks or that could be uh, a billion dollars. Um, but in general, that's not a bad bracket for what VC firms do. Um, now, so who are these limited partners? Uh, in general, they can be things like uh, UT is one of the top four in the country. 
uh, they call it UTIPCO, but it's a it's a basically a retirement fund for the university. Um, they're an interesting one because they disclose a lot of things about venture capital, so it's kind of a two-edged sword there for certain VCs who don't want their, their returns and their dirty laundry earth. But uh, um, Yale, Harvard, UT, um, those, that's a category of people who fund venture capital because when they have retirement <coughs> funds or um, uh, <coughs> pools of money that they'd like to go make money from, they'll take some and put it in real estate, and they'll take some and put it in venture capital, and they'll take some and put it in what have you, and they'll sort of diversify their portfolio. And VC, private equity in general, is part of that. Um, public pension funds, um, CalPERS is a big one out in California, is another <laughs> typical source of venture capital. And again, they're trying to diversify their portfolio. So they'll take some of that and put it in some of the big um, and small venture companies over time. But anyway, these are the limited partners, and they create a fund for the sake of this discussion, let's call it a $100 million fund that a venture capital firm has to distribute money, and typically they'll do that in a 10 year period of time. Life of the fund tends to be 10 years. You got 10 years to, you got kind of half that time to invest it, and you got the rest of the time to sort of make something happen with it, but by and large, without sort of bending the rules, that's kind of the time frame for it. So, how does a VC pay rent? How do they pay salaries? How do they keep the lights on? Um, there's a management fee, which is the first way that, that money comes into a venture capital firm, and that's typically 2% of whatever that fund is. So if you have a $100 million fund, you've got $2 million bucks a year, that's so 2% per year times the size of the fund, that's sort of divided up in salaries, by a computer, by a crazy house up in Aspen, just whatever a venture capital firm wants to do. Um, if you have a billion dollar fund, that 2% number gets pretty big pretty quickly. Um, arguably, you could you could get rich just dividing up 2% of the billion dollar fund up its, um, yeah, amongst its top tier partners, which is an interesting financial incentive. Um, in terms of the other way that venture capitalists make money. So there's a management fee, 2% times the size of fund, year over year. Which is 20% over the total of life, right? Well, yes, we'll, we'll come to you have to compound that, but we'll, we'll come back to that. The other way that venture capitalists make money is the carry. So the carry is a percentage of the fund, over the fund, after the fund gets paid back. There's a percentage over the fund, every dollar over this $100 million we have, after we pay back the $100 million, there's a percentage of that fund that the venture capitalists get to keep. So typically that's between 20 and 30 percent, depending on the, the VC. Um, so if this $100 million fund wants to <coughs> make money in a, in a non-management fee-oriented way, first thing they have to do is pay back the $100 million. The second thing they have to do is pay back the management fee. So over the course of about 10 years, you have to pay back two million bucks every year that the fund was around. So that's kind of good for the investors. You got to pay back that management fee. That's not because that's kind of fair. Um, and then for every dollar over that, in this case, over 120 million, every dollar over that, let's call it 20 percent. 20 cents goes to the, the VC firm, and 80 cents goes to those investors. So, in a small fund, an interesting observation can be in a small fund where. Um, 2% of a of $100 million, which 2 million bucks seems like a lot, but at the end of the day, you're not really gonna get rich off of a firm spreading 2 million bucks over rent and, and computers and salary and all the things it has to do day in and day out. Um, a smaller fund tends to be a little bit more aligned with its investors because the only way that VCs really make big dollars, millions of dollars, is the same way that their investors make big dollars, which is when their companies return so much that there's a carry on the other side. Interestingly, in billion dollar funds, there's a little bit more conflict, in my opinion. Um, because you can you can actually sit around and get rich off of a management fee over the course of 10 years without any carry ever coming back. And so, um, one of the things that is an interesting thing to think through in terms of should you raise venture capital, um, a smaller firm that owns 20% of your company um, can be a lot happier with a smaller outcome, because if you sell your business for $100 million and the venture capital firm owns 20% of that, um, they get 20 million bucks, that's a fifth of the firm. 20% of the entire fund, sorry, 20% of the fund is paid back in $100 million deal. 
If that same scenario exists in a billion dollar venture capital fund and they sell a company for $100 million and they own 20% of it, $20 million of a billion dollar fund, that's not, you're not really filling that bucket back up to where the carry starts to matter. And so in larger firms, there's a behavior that um, is a little bit more swing for the fences because they'd much rather have a billion dollar outcome so that there's $200 million going against the return of that fund than a $20 million outcome, which might have been okay in a different size firm. Does that make sense? And so you may want a much bigger investment. You may have a billion dollar Twitter-like, Facebook-like uh, opportunity on your hands. In that case, bigger checks with bigger outcomes tend to be more aligned with bigger funded VCs. And if you have a, uh, uh, an opportunity that you're not sure whether it's a $50 million company or a $100 million company or a $200 million company, the flexibility of outcome might be better served by a smaller funded VC just because their obligations to their investors is different. Make sense? Questions? Uh, do you get all the money up front for your fund from your investors or, or are they on call? So most of the time, I'm going to drink some cereal this one time. Um, so the, the question is, do you, how, do you get all that 100 million bucks in this theoretical example up front or do you, what, what happens with that? <laughs> So typically, the way that works is you get um, a commitment through um, some number of limited partners who invest that, and there's some amount of money that you need to sort of close the fund and say that you're done. But that commitment isn't $100 million all up front. And what you do is you do capital calls over time um, and bring additional funds into the firm so that the firm can go make the investments that it needs to and the, the people that support it you know, have not, are not 100% cash out of pocket where it's sitting in your account and you're earning a float on that versus them having it in their account earning a float on that. And so typically, most firms will draw down their fund in the first four to five years, depending on how aggressive they are. But in general, whatever the size of that fund is, um, it doesn't show up all at once and it does come down in chunks over time, typically four or five years. So in general, a larger fund goes for a later stage investments? Not necessarily. Um, not necessarily. It, it winds up being a little bit easier math-wise to do later stage investments for big funds because they can, like if you take Kleiner Perkins and their take on Twitter, they're like, okay, look, we were, we were late to the game on Twitter, but we're absolutely willing to go yeah, put two hundred million dollars to work at a, I think, two or three billion. I don't know, a couple billion dollar, a couple few billion dollar valuation, because our bet very simply is, um, it's a real business, and we're going to go get a couple, two, three times our money on that two hundred million dollar investment, and ultimately that's good for us. We can, you know, we're not an early stage investor where we'd like a bigger return, a ten times, an eight times return. We're a later stage investor in that 200 million. Um, we just want to get two or three times that money. And it's, I think, a little bit, it's less about the firm with the size of the fund. I think it's more about the size of the bet they want to place. Uh, in my experience, a $200 million bet inside a company, I think, needs to be a little bit later stage where you're trying to earn just a couple multiples <laughs> of that versus an early stage investment where you might put $20 million to work in Twitter two years prior and hope that that gets to be a 10x type of thing. So, and in case in point, I mean, here in, in town, Austin Ventures will do early stage you know, Series A deals. Um, I think the size of the fund pulls them in the direction. And they're a multi-billion dollar fund. They're a billion dollar fund. And the size of that fund pulls them in the direction of trying to cause those early stage companies to swing harder for longer, outcome, bigger outcomes in the fullness of time, um, but doesn't preclude them from doing early stage investments. And their sweet spot, that I don't, know, I don't want to say their sweet spot, but something they've done many times that, that, that they seem to be well known for is this $50 million roll up, where it's like, now it's, it's always $50 million on almost everyone that I've heard. So that's kind of like, I, I assume, not everyone, it's like a magic number for them where they feel like if they can put $50 million to work, that's going to produce the kind of, you looking around for Austin Ventures people. Yeah, is there any Austin Ventures people? So, uh, so you know, Homeway, 
It's probably that kind of size thing, right? Dotch's group was announced like a $50 million roll-up of, uh, of a bunch of these social consulting groups, right? And they've got other ones like that where they see an opportunity like, wow, we can put, you know, I don't know how much was committed to Whale Shark, but Whale Shark Media is another like rolling up all these coupon sites into this mega thing that can then create a lot of value, get economies of scale, and go public. Yet, they also do early stage stuff. Yeah. But, but those, they like those 50 million dollars. Um, I, I, have, I have something I want to share on this topic. Before I do, you kick, you were earlier talking about lifestyle businesses and you have to decide what it is. Can you speak a little bit to uh, like what's, why, why most people don't invest in consulting businesses? You, you spoke to barbershop or kind of like hairstylists, but like consulting yeah. businesses often, I think, think they should go raise money. And yeah, so um, have you talked about consulting businesses? And I have to do that a well-defined term. So, um, if you sort of you, if you try to be a little bit converted, sort of think about technology companies, um, you can imagine um, a company that creates a product one time and sells it a bunch. Um, take solar winds in town, package software that does some system management stuff. You write it one time, you put it on a website, you can sell it a bunch of times. Yeah, in general, that's sort of categorically a product company. Um, a service company, my definition would be what you're really trading on, the product that you're selling, the thing that you're making money from, from your customers are, you're trading on time and materials associated with the expertise of, in general, people. Now, those people may be uh, serve it, leveraged by, by using technology and tools, but ultimately, um, what you, and a service company is, is, is basically selling the expertise of the folks that are in that company. And that's a, you know, an ad agency is a great example of that, right? The, the creative genius that comes up with, uh, you know, where's the beef for Wendy's 10 years ago? Probably way too young to decide. Um, but you know, those ideas are very much a service-oriented industry. They're, they're um, the ideas that come from folks that, that, that doesn't scale any better. You can't shrink wrap any of that and sell it a bunch of times. Um, Accenture is a, a good example of a true services-oriented company where they'll come in and they'll install, integrate, you know, implement software systems, complexity, but ultimately you're, you're paying for this firm to apply herbs of energy from its people um, to go solve a particular thing. You're not paying for this piece of software. Um, it's the same as a million people would have bought. The problem with that is obviously the leverage and the scalability of the businesses. And in one, where you can write something once and sell it a million times, um, I mean, arguably, hopefully everybody in here understands that you can do that in your bedroom right now, today, um, put up a website and make that happen. Um, whether that's the next Twitter or a piece of software that social or that, that Solar Winds would sell. Um, if you're gonna run a services business, the way that that business is scales tends to be, uh, if you think about, okay, well, I'm an expert in this, and some company wants to pay me for that. Okay, well, what if 10 companies want to do that? You know, uh, barring your ability to clone yourself, you've got to go find a bunch of similar skilled and expert folks so that you can have enough time and materials, hours in the day, to go service those customers, right? Because you're scaling by people versus scaling by technology or product. And so <coughs> service-oriented businesses just, you know, the, there's a cliche in the industry. Uh, Product-oriented businesses multiply and service-oriented businesses add. Um, and most cliches are true because, most cliches are cliches because they are true. Um, and so VCs tend to not invest in those service-oriented businesses because they want to see the leverage of distribution and product-oriented um, you know, sales and scale happen versus sort of the the very linear effect of selling <coughs> time and materials for people. So I mean, Josh talks about you know services versus product. That's the way I think about it. Um, you might have a services business that is not a lifestyle business. So arguably you could say um, a painting house painting business is a services business. Accenture would probably argue that they're a high growth business, but the, the challenge of scaling that business is much greater because of the expertise required of the folks in that. They need to understand how to implement this crazy software and integrate it with the variety of systems that exist in their customers. And so you could, you could call that high growth, and I think, it, I mean, back in the day it probably was, but 
the challenge in scaling that and the cost and the margin associated, the cost of scaling and the margin associated with the business is almost universally lower in a services oriented business than a product oriented business. Yeah, so, so most of those things don't get funded. So most of those things don't get funded. Unless it's a very unusual case, you would be raising money for a consulting business. So, um, do you have a question? Yeah, do you have a question for it? Oh, actually, yeah. Um, so if a VC is an interest in funding for a services company, are there are there funding options there for services companies or just in general they don't get funded? I mean, I would say, I mean, my answer to that would be kind of the cool thing about services companies, you should be able to bootstrap that. You're like, I'm gonna find my first customer and they're gonna suck all of my time and maybe the person I'm starting the companies with because I'm gonna be providing the service for them. And when I start to scale that, I'm gonna take a little bit of that and go hire the next person and start, to, you know, the easiest bootstrappable company that exists is a services-based company that has got um, its first customer. Because you're like, okay, well, find a customer, I'm gonna go hire this next person if you can find it, and uh, and then you just grow. But, you know, if you're busy to make money, adding that next person gets harder and harder and harder. So it'll often, if you do raise money, it'll often just take a, it'll look more like a loan or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, look into the different structure and, and meet it. Derek. So there is the case of the service companies that bootstrap and develop products in the course of this bootstrapping, and then they turn the corner. And it's true. Yeah. That's true. Now, those are rare, more rare. They are rare. Um, but you can imagine that if you're running a services company, so here's the thing I always say, because there's companies that come in, I mean, you've probably seen them as well. Bob's point is very simple. Sometimes you can be a services company doing all this cool stuff for different customers, and all of a sudden the product idea springs to life, and you're like, ah. You know, now we're going to become a, a product company. We're doing the same thing over and over again. Wow, we can automate that. Maybe we can do do that. And 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 the reason I think that's extremely rare. In fact, in fact, I think it's a trap. Is because um, it's an easy thing to say, but if you think about, I mean, and it's hard to trust me that as you're executing this services thing, where arguably every hour of every day is sucked up by your customers that you want to keep happy and you're trying to find the next one and typically you're finding the next one to suddenly stop that behavior or not even stop that behavior but augment that behavior with by trying to productize something um, and begin to um, behave like a product company which is a different sort of sales cycle which is a different set of requirements if you're using this technology to to run the services business that's very different than productizing that technology so that anyone can use that to go do whatever it is that you're doing. And so, yeah, at, at some point you're gonna have to stop doing this one thing and start doing this other thing, or carve off a piece of the company to do that, and then in, in my experience, I sort of liken it to um, pejoratively, you know, you're hooked on crack at that point. And saying no to the next service gig or pulling somebody away from making that dollar so they can go focus on something else, is a really, really hard thing to go do because, because you're taking somebody away from a surefire dollar that's coming in the door, customer that you can make happy, and you're saying, stop, we think we can go this other direction. And so it either takes huge scale or it takes um, really robust determination and belief that this is the right thing to go do. And so when people come in and, to me and they're like, look, we're gonna bootstrap this by doing services, and then we're gonna turn into a product company, I'm pretty reticent to believe that that's going to work because that's going to cause, they're going to, every time that they're successful as a services company is going to pull them further into the business model where they're going to get more customers, they're going to be asked to do more things, they're going to get more dollars for doing that. And saying no to that is a very difficult thing to go do. And so it's not impossible. There's plenty of examples in the world, but in general, it's hard to start in this style of business and transition to that style of business. It's certainly not possible. It's just, yeah. How difficult a jump do you want to try to land? That, that, was, that is actually how I started my first company was we were bootstrapping it by doing consulting stuff and hosting stuff and things like that, and then we would do the product company. And but most people I talk to, most people I, I, I know tons of people that have problems with that and can't make that switch. And for me, I think it's just that I was I didn't really switch. I started out my head was already product stuff. I just happened to be doing the other things. It'd be very easy for a venture capitalist to say, I get it, that's cool. Bootstrap your business and come back to me when you have a yeah. product that you want to go scale up and, and talk to me then. So I want to um, I, I want to real quickly show this diagram I drew, which I also just posted to the Facebook group, which you'll probably be able to read much better than this. 
And then just considering we're on the first slide and it's been half an hour, I think we should uh, jump on. Let, let's jump to the next slide, next topic. But save some questions or write them down. And either if we have more time at the end, we'll do them. Or we'll also, uh, can, if you email them, you can email them. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. So this is a this little this is a two by two grid. Hopefully you guys have all seen two by two grids. These are really useful for looking for looking at a lot of things. Squeak of a chop. When you uh, when you in your investor deck, you often will have a market slide that looks something like this, and you make it such that you're up in the upper right hand corner. <laughs> that that description. But what this is supposed to be is what, whether you're a good fit for raising money. So the the vectors here. This is scale scalability of the business. How big can it get? Whether it's going to be small or it can get really big. And this is how much capital is required, how much money you need. So whether you don't need a lot of money or you need a lot of money. So one up here is something that needs a lot of money and can get very, very big. Down here is something that doesn't need much money and won't get very big. Here's something that doesn't need much money but can get very big. And here's something that needs a lot of money and can't get very big. <laughs> That's why it says no. <laughs> you don't want to do something that needs a lot of money. And very big. But the other ones are they're interesting. So if it doesn't need a lot of money and it can't get very big, then that's something you should bootstrap. Because it doesn't need a lot of money, so you can start it quickly. And it does it's not it can't get very big, so VCs aren't going to want to invest in it. Right? If it needs a lot of money and it can get very big, then that's really good for venture capital because it needs a lot of money, which means you can't bootstrap it, and that's what VCs want to go invest in. So the interesting hard part here is the it can get very big and it doesn't need a lot of money. So then how do you decide I think that's great. Then how do you decide? Should you raise money or not? And the, the vector here is what are the barriers to entry? So if there are strong barriers to entry, meaning you can get started and it's hard for other people to get into it, then you might want to try to bootstrap it because you can follow things Kip said. You can keep more of the company, you can use other things, and once you get started, it's hard for other people to get in. If it's easy for other people to copy or get in, then it's more likely you should raise venture capital because then you want more money. So I think that's fast. So there's a question here that's how much, right? Yeah. Well, this is this is just like where do I fit in? You know, it's not, it doesn't really have so much, but. I think there's a. Slides, yeah, it's slides. Okay, so I, think, I think there's some nuance to the. Yes. But anyway, I just found this, I, I saw this once and I, I, I just hand, hand, hung on to it. I should have put it in the deck, but I just posted it to the Facebook group where there's a nicer description of it that I thought was really helpful. Okay, so let's try and move on to the next topic. All right. So, Kip, what would you look for if you were going to find, if one of these teams, if you're looking at Demo Day in three weeks, and you're like, yeah. looking at these companies, and you know these are student companies, which probably makes you a little skeptical to begin with, <laughs> what's going to make them stick out? Why would you consider funding a student company? Well, I'm just, okay, well, look, I'm, you know, all uh, marketing aside, I don't really care at all whether it's a student company or not. Truly, I don't. Um, we funded, we just moved one company down, Josh Nesman, they're called Black Locust. They basically graduated Carnegie Mellon and we moved into Austin. Um, we funded another company called Spare Foot that, that packed up from UCLA and moved to Austin. It was the first generation capital factory stuff. Um, I don't care whether it's a student. I mean, uh, honestly, I'll tell you the truth. We've got a grandfather, and we've got those two companies I mentioned in the Silverton portfolio, and they're both they're both doing fine. I don't. I think there's a certain age advantage, frankly, uh, in being younger in startups. Um, I'm not age biased. I'd like, I'd love pointing at the grandfather and saying, "See, this is my proof." Um, the the advantage, I think, just from an age perspective, is simple. Um, the younger you are, um, in general, the less obligations you have in terms of, like, I've got two kids and a whole bunch of payments I've got to make, and the propensity for me to be able to take risks and stay up till three in the morning. You know, age aside, uh, you know, old age aside, it's just lower now than it was before. So there is definitely a window where you have just more cycles and herds of energy that you can spend. Doesn't mean that you can't do that as old as you want to get. It just means that I think you just have an easier time doing it when you're younger. But in terms of funding a company, I could give a flip about um, how old folks are and. and what it is. So I'd, so I'd say, what does it mean to, to fund a business? Um, I have a blog post I should, I should have memorized, but uh, I had like five things in there. It's like all that we ever look for. Um, and it's simple. Like I'd love to see, um, ideally, it'd be great if you were experienced in some dimension, either the market that you're in or, the, or starting a company or what have you. So some experience relative to what you're doing in the company would be nice from the, from the founders. Um, in a market that's big, with some defensible, unfair advantage, um, in a capitally efficient model, 
and some proof that what you're doing has some market traction. I think those are the five things. Um, any one of those things isn't a deal killer. You know, a majority of those things not having them makes it harder. But I'd say the thing that you should think through in terms of creating a compelling opportunity um, is having some, the biggest risk when, when VCs look at deals, all we're trying to really understand is how to assess the risk that is associated with this particular business. The, the, no business is without risk. And so we need to chunk it up in some way. Typically we chunk it up in, ter in terms of team risk. Is this team good or, or is, it, is it especially outrageously good or especially outrageously bad uh, for this particular opportunity? If you're you know, uh, doing a semiconductor company, have you done 14 other semiconductors in this particular market? Okay, well that's pretty compelling. Um, so there's team oriented risk, there's product risk. Can this team build this product that they're talking about? So if you step out of the business school and you're like, I've got this incredible idea, but I don't know how to write a line of code. Um, that's pretty big product oriented risk actually. It tends to be a bit of a team risk as well. But, but ultimately, can you get, can you do what you're saying you're gonna do relative to the technology and the, and the product? Um, you know, if you show up with a product that's already done, you can sort of demo that. That takes a lot of that risk off the table. And then there's market risk. Are you playing in a market that is big enough to accommodate a new entrant? Is there uh, this huge not invented here thing in a particular market? Is it, uh, is it completely locked up in some old boys network that makes you know, an enormous barrier to entry? So we try to check it up in some way um, to sort of assess the risk. And anything you can do to start knocking those bits of risk off the table by having a team that's got relative experience, by having a product that's demonstrable, not only maybe even demonstrable, but you know, you've got beta customers or you have actual paying customers. That's a tremendous validation of you've got something valuable enough for somebody to part with money. Um, and we'd like to imagine, you can't do much about your market. You've got to, you, you kind of need to pick the right market. That said, you, there's some esoteric markets out there. We've got Spare Foot um, operates in the self-storage market. Um, literally, the, the rental garages that uh, exist everywhere. And, you know, when we first started looking at it, it was like, really, you know, the self-storage market, that sounds pretty freaking boring. And yet, it's a $20 billion market where, the largest player called public storage in the entire market only controls 6% of the inventory in that market. And their market cap, that one company's market cap is just under $20 billion. $20 billion means the amount of revenue that flows through the industry every year. The market cap that that one company has is as big as the entire industry, but it only controls 6% of that market. So that's a pretty freaking cool market. Um, as boring as it initially sounded. So market risk, you gotta, you know, what's a, what's a bad market, for example? Um, you know, uh, systems management, generically speaking, is an interestingly sort of, it's a big market, it's, it's probably 40 or $60 billion, but it's wildly dominated, um, I think, by people like Oracle and IBM, BMC, you know, Symantec. Um, but guess what, there's this thing called the cloud and they don't know really how to do that yet. So there's an opportunity inside that larger market that is growing extremely fast. It's actually really interesting. So those three things are, are big chunks of risk. Um, we try to look at those and sort of assess, um, you know, where are you strong, where are you weak? Um, and I'd say if you have a product that you feel like has got some differentiation to it that you can defend over time, um, either through execution or even patents and whatnot, um, that's a good start. If you've got proof that that is worth money from customers, that's even better. Um, this is gonna bleed into another one of these questions, which is how much should we raise? And it, and it goes along with what Josh was saying before. Another thing that we're gonna look for in terms of funding any company, not just a student, is if you don't have some of those questions answered, like let's say you've never sold one of these things that you're building before then you're sort of guessing as to what the cost of acquiring a customer might be. I'd call it the cost to serve. Um, there's some marketing cost, there's some marketing effort, there's some sales motion that you have to go through um, that you'd like to imagine can be repeatable in some scale. 
And until you sort of understand whether you've got a, people come to my website and give me their credit card, and I don't have to do anything else, or you, you know, people come to my website and they give me an email address, and I've got to go hire an inside salesperson to pick up the phone and call them back, or email them back, or do a bunch of things, or like, none of that works. I've got to go hire some person to go fly over to that company and, you know, knock on the door and physically sell this thing to those people by talking to whoever they need to talk to. You know, the, I would call that sort of a touchless model, an ISR lead gen model, and a direct sales model. Um, those things cost wildly different dollars. And so if you don't have any data that sort of says what's starting to work for your business, then I don't have any data that really tells me how much money you need to go scale that up. And so like, do you need $100,000 or do you need $10 million to go make this a, a $10 million business? I don't know, because you don't know. Um, and so anything that you can do to add those pieces of data in terms of what it takes to make your business repeatable, which is to mean scalable, um, you know, helps me get excited about knowing how much you need and how easy it might be for you to scale those businesses. And so that's not a student, that's any sort of company. And the more you can add to that, the more I think it makes a lot of sense to go try to raise that money because you know what it takes to you know, put enough gas in the tank for that particular business to drive it to some place that's interesting in terms of the amount of revenue, the number of customers, the proof points in the business it takes the risk off the table for your investors today and tomorrow. What, what percentage of the companies you fund do you look at a traditional business plan for first? None. Zero. <laughs> Don't write a business plan. I only wrote one business plan is for my first company, never wrote a business plan after that. Um, business plans are great. Mm -hmm. You can write a business plan. If you're going to write a business plan, you should write it for yourself. Um, it's a great place to capture all your research. It's a great place to sort of wax poetic about the things that you think you know, are true today and true tomorrow. Um, feel free to knock yourself out with a 50-page business plan. No investor that I know is going to go through that and read it. Um, why? Because they, they tend to break things down in much simpler, sort of easier to assess ways. What's the, what's the team risk? What's the product risk? What's the market risk? What's the execution risk? Um, and they can get that in a much simpler way, talking to the team, seeing the product, you know, a PowerPoint presentation doesn't substitute for a business plan, but it's a framework for having a conversation about all those things in a transparent enough way that you can, you're either going to get people interested or not. A business plan, I mean, I wrote one, so I can say with assurity that I'm the only person who ever wrote it. Read it. Uh, maybe the founders, co-founders read it, but no investor we ever handed it to read it. It can occasionally pass the weight test in terms of like, look, no, really, I thought about this long and hard, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna get you funded. It's not gonna, it's not gonna be meaningful in terms of anybody's decision relative to, to funding. Now, I posted up to the Facebook group while he was talking a link to Kip's blog, which is awesome. And one of the things on there that's particularly awesome and like the best post I've ever seen on this topic is here's exactly what your investor deck should look like. Here's each slide you should have. And I think for a lot you of don't have to follow that. It's just these are the things. Rearrange it, add to it, subtract from it, but maybe not subtract from it. But there's at least the reason that it's there is because there's a bare minimum set of information that you need to convey. But for a lot of companies, that's the new business plan. It's the deck. And like Kip said, it doesn't it doesn't mean you don't talk about other things, but it's just that gives you a framework to have a conversation. The best investor conversations I've ever had have not been ones where I sent them a big thing to read and they read it and then came back and said, Oh, you're right. It was ones where we had a really good conversation, and it all happened in the conversation, and they made up their mind from the conversation. Maybe I sent them other stuff, but the conversation is where they connected and made a decision. It's kind of a dumb question, but my pitch deck doesn't have any words on it. It's great, even better. It's fantastic. Most people have horribly too many words <laughs> in their pitch deck, like well, they're trying to. Ten words over the whole thing. I think. Well, I mean, okay, that kind of sounds. Like, you just need to understand. It's intriguing. Before. Like, I mean, if that's the kind of thing, here's, here's the only thing I'd say about that. And honestly, the, that you have one, and I don't know if that's part of the program to sort of create one, but that's the most healthy thing you can go do. Because if you can create a pitch deck soup to nuts right now, um, you're thinking very maturely about your, your product, your team, your, your vision, your market, what you're doing today, what you're going to do tomorrow. Uh, I mean, I would expect, honestly, but most of you wouldn't be able to create a complete pitch deck because 
that's early enough. It's, it's such a potentially early stage set of companies, but it's a great framework for analyzing that. The thing I would say about having 10 words in the entire deck is um, a tactical thing. So the tactical thing is when you meet with investors, typically um, venture capital firms, um, larger angels tend to be partnerships. And that is relevant only in as much as um, where companies are hierarchical and the CEO gets to say, go do this because I said so. Partnerships are very much partnerships and you you convince and cajole and, and persuade and make decisions together. And so, when you go talk to one of these companies, you will tend to not have every partner in the room at the same time. <coughs> in fact, you may just meet with one or, or even a, a associate. Yeah, an associate, which is what they call um, you know, the folks who do all the really hard work at big firms and then take it and give it to the larger partners and then they're like, oh, I can just pontificate. Um, and so if you hand over a desk that is really dependent on you being there to tell the story, then it's hard for that, it's very hard for that associate or that partner to sort of convey that story to the rest of their partners because they're like, oh, I think, I think what they're talking about here was, um, ah, I forget. So there, it's a fine line. What you would like, I think, in general, is to have as few words as possible and, and the most pictures possible, um, different brain paths through eyes to the brain. Um, but enough to where if they took your deck and they handed it to somebody who was not in that meeting, where you're sort of giving that pitch, that you could have that, the core messages that you think are the most important be conveyed to other folks. So it has to be able to sort of speak for you when you're not there. Is having the words in the notes section an option for that? Or it's kind of like a business plan. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, my, as a slightly different perspective on it, I think, um, I don't like, so first of all, you just need to, I, I generally almost think of like I have two versions of the deck. Here's the one I give if I'm talking, and here's the one I would email somebody, because they're totally different things if I'm speaking to it than if someone's reading it without me speaking to it, in which case it's got to have a whole bunch more words on it because normally my slides wouldn't have a lot of words on it. Um, and then the other thing is just, I find a lot of um, VCs default reaction or any investors is like, oh yeah, sure, send me your deck. That's like the first thing they'll say to you, you tell me they send me your deck. And that's like kind of a, in some ways a lazy thing for them, it's their way of screening, but I never want to send them my deck like cold. Because I just find they take the deck, they read it, when it's really meant for me to be giving it to them and they make an initial decision or impression based on that and that's not what I want them to do. And that's one reason I really actually like AngelList um, and that format of like an executive summary, just particularly, I just like their executive summary. They just ask me the right questions to make an executive summary. That's one reason I do that. But I would rather send them that, which is a shorter thing that's designed for them to read and is like designed to pull them in. It's more like the elevator pitch and then try to get the chance to go talk to them if somebody asks you for a deck and, and without a meeting, I think that is bad behavior. It's um, okay to say no. And you, and you should say no. Say no, send them a link to Angelus, or, or take that and scrape it into an executive summary and say, look, you know, if you want to meet, I'm happy to, to show you, but I'm not going to. No, but far into that spectrum, just to be clear, is like, well, I can't show you this without signing an NDA, and that's not realistic either. VCs will never sign an NDA. But I think it's very fair to say, Love to give you my deck. I want to do that person. I want to tell you the story a little bit. Let me give you this executive summary, or point you at my Angelus uh, you know, entry, and, and try to get them to say yes or no there. But you can say no for sure. You can say no. In fact, you'll be in the minority, which is always an interesting place to be in terms of. No, I'm not going to do that. I go. That was very self. -confident. Um, so yeah, you don't have to, but, but I do think if you want to leave something behind, if you had a good meeting, I think you do want that to be able to communicate for you more than maybe 10 words. Ago. But I'd have to see it. Um, and I'm happy to look at it. So we happen to know that's a fantastic presentation she got for her deck, her cordless deck. Yeah. Have you ever had anybody sending you video deck where they're pre-recorded so you get the best of both worlds? Them there talking in front of you and it only takes you five minutes to review it? Not yet, not yet. Nobody said, just check out this video. Um, what would you react to? I'd, I'd watch it, yeah. I mean, you should keep it, I mean, there's a, 
One of the one of the uh, <laughs> one of the companies I started did, did uh, video analytics before uh, video analytics were cool, and I can tell you the graph for how people watch videos looks like you know, this, and, and and I don't care what time is here, but but you've got you've basically got a minute. I mean, honestly, you've got thirty seconds if you want to be sure before average people sort of start to to trail off. So if you want to send a video, I just say you know. You better hook them here, and then fill out the details here. But I'd watch it. I'd watch it for sure. Um, I, I see people do it with their pitch videos. You know, and that's part of like what they get out of demo day, right? And you're gonna have a video of your pitch, and it's gonna be about five minutes long, and that's a nice send in. Here, if you want some more info, here's my pitch, and they get this, they know it's five minutes. And now that said, it has to be. I mean, if you wanna if you wanna do that as your sort of intro, it, it's gotta be kind of. It's sort of grainy, and you know, you can kind of hear the sound, and it's not, you know, like that's just not going to compel anybody to continue watching. But I, I think that's fine. I haven't seen anybody do it for whatever reason. Why won't VC sign in here? Um, it's actually super simple because um, they get sued too often. Um, our our business, very simply, is to look at everything that comes through and. And we'll fund one thing, and we won't fund something else because of the team or the market or some other twist to that. And if there's if the Venn diagram overlap of one business and the other business, you know, touches like this or touches like that, you know, we're not sort of making investments to sort of go steal ideas. Um, you know, it, it never happens that way. If you wind up signing a bunch of NDAs and you look at a hundred deals before you sign one, which is probably a pretty reasonable sort of way to average things out. In that hundred deals, is there some number of things that probably applies to that thing? Yeah, probably. You know, I, I couldn't even go back and catalog what that meant. And so, just keeping your hands clean and saying, "Send me only the stuff that you feel comfortable sharing," you know, publicly. I don't want to see anything confidential. Is just a super healthy way to. I mean, I think that's the right way to go. You don't want to share anything that's sort of a, a deeper until you get much further in the conversation. Um, but that's why. I mean, it's not a big conspiracy or anything. It's just the fact that our business is to look at everything that comes across our desk that we can possibly look at, and that exposes us to so many things that somewhere the Venn diagram sort of stops working relative to separation. The next one. What, is, what, what, what are they getting from investors? Nothing! <laughs> um, so, um, money. Money, most investors' money is as green as the next investor's money. Um, that that part is super true. Um, what, but you know, go back to what I said earlier. You can't fire your investors, and so what else you get is a really important thing to consider. Um, you get questions. You get questions, and then hopefully they're productive questions. Um, I think one thing that's true in my experience, having run a bunch of different companies, is. The easiest thing in the world for an investor to say is, we're smart money. We add a lot of value. We, we really like to roll up our sleeves. We really like to roll up our sleeves and, and, and help. <laughs> and, uh, and while that's the easiest thing to say, it actually turns out to be, for the investor, really hard to do because it, it's heavy lifting and it's hard. And, and what it means to add value is a snowflake problem. It's different for this company. It's different for that company. It's different for that company. Um, so for sure, you get money. Um, for sure, you get some amount of oversight and questions because you're, guess what? You're working with other people's money, so you have an <coughs> obligation to them. A reporting obligation, a, a relationship obligation, in some cases a board seat obligation. Um, but if you pick an investor wisely, you pick a good investor, what you get is somebody who's uh, gonna ask you questions or offer you counsel because they know the difference between a light at the end of the tunnel and an oncoming train. And because they've seen it before for some reason. Um, they have a network of folks that they can pick up the phone and try to help you recruit one way or the other. Um, they know how to structure a deal. They know how to structure a comp plan. They know how to do a set of things that you're gonna have to go do. And if they're a shortcut or a templated way to go do that, then that's some pretty good value. And if they help you hire your salesperson that goes out and sells the next $10 million worth of business, then crap, that's, yeah, you know, the last company, um, the biggest value I've seen from an investor in a long time is, uh, okay, uh, 
um, is one of our companies called Socialware just um, took a uh, $7 million investment led by Morgan Stanley Venture Partners, um, which is a great deal because they're in the financial services industry. Morgan Stanley is a big name in that industry. That's all good. So with that came, um, with that investment came their their lead uh, guy in that firm within Morgan Stanley, um, a guy named Pete Chung, who's now on the board. And basically he showed up actually in the process of, of closing the round, which is, um, yeah, what you also get from investors is a, is a lengthy due diligence process and a long time to close. You know, working with investors is a multi-month sort of process. Within that period of time for this particular company, the new investor basically um, heard that the company was looking for a CFO, recommended a couple guys, really recommended this one guy that actually lived out on the West Coast, um, cajoled him into coming to Austin for an interview. This was in this summer, so if you, anybody's here this summer, it's 90 plus days, 105 degrees, anybody on the West Coast who comes here and decides to stay, it's fairly miraculous. Um, <laughs> and yet, this guy brought in the CFO that this company hired uh, while they were trying to close this entire round which a CFO in a company at a particular size is just a really valuable, critical hire. And uh, this guy sort of showed up and, and did it on the fly as he was actually investing, um, using his network, you know, basically bringing those guy, that guy out to, to Austin. And uh, you, know, you pick the right one, they, the value that they can bring, the acceleration they can bring to the business is so far beyond money that it's, it's stunning in some cases. And the trick, really, ultimately, is knowing that upfront is very difficult. So if you're going to go raise money from a from an investor, um, you've got to do your own due diligence. They're going to do due diligence on you. You've got to go do due diligence on them. You've got to talk to every company they've invested in. Go find the companies that have failed that they've invested in. Every investor that's invested for any period of time has got companies that have failed. How did they handle that? Were they good guys? Were they assholes? Um, Dig in and find out, and if you do, then I think what's going to what's going to show up is sort of you want a partner that can not only be good in the good case, but can be good and in, in, or at least tolerable, acceptable, rational in the bad case, and you can find these things out. And honestly, if you went to an investor that you're trying to potentially take money from and said, "Look, I want to talk to your portfolio companies before this thing happens. Give me a list of your CEOs." You know, I want to go do that. Are you comfortable doing that? If they don't say yes, then that should be a big red flag. Um, so, you know, it's a, you know, it takes two to tango sort of situation, and you've got to, got to, got to choose them wisely. On that, there's a site called The Funded, yeah. which is basically a place where people can go and honestly bitch about VCs. <laughs> so, it's a reviews and ratings for uh, for VCs, yeah. and so. Um, that's one one of those data points you could go look at. Now keep in mind what it is. People, there are lots of things out there that might not be credible, you know, but it gives you some other insights. And then like things like AngelList have comments where people can say, you know, the, the things they like about good investors and things like that. So you definitely yeah. should go talk to people. So get every get every bit of data you can possibly get on. It. There's yeah. no that's totally fair. Do VC firms actually like the opportunity to recruit for a company? you come in and see if you really need a CEO and you didn't know him more, is that something that you guys like? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, we joke all the time at Silverton that if we actually ran a recruiting firm, we'd be, okay, <laughs> screw the management fee, I'd take the <laughs> recruiting fees. Um, we're probably running a million dollar a year recruiting company. I think we put 20 people into companies this year. Um, the reason, like, is it easy? No. Is it, um, is it fun? Sometimes. But does it completely facilitate our investment in terms of de-risking it and making the company scale better and, and just generally doing the right thing? Yeah, that's so true that the answer is so yes to that part that everything else doesn't matter. Uh, it's so important that the right folks get in the right company at the right time that, look, if it was like, sticking your finger in your eye and painful and horrible, like we still should do that because it's so good. So it's actually not a bad thing. And if you, like Silverton invest, we have 14 investments. Um, every one of them is headquartered in Austin. There's one that has some chunk of stuff out in the Cowan, but, um, but everyone's 
headquartered in Austin. Why is that? Um, not just because we don't want to travel, it's also because our network is in Austin and we know who lives where and what they want to do and how great to do that so we can facilitate the, the recruiting stuff. And so, yeah, I mean, it doesn't even really matter whether we like it or not. We're so overwhelmingly, and everybody should be, so overwhelmingly predisposed to make that the right thing that, which is why the example of the CFO bringing on a, you know, the new investor bringing on a CFO is so cool. It's like, shit, that was, you know, it's a huge ad. You know, good job. Um, and another thing, we'll though, the investors also, one reason why I think a lot of them would, would like that as well is they want to get their people in in some way. Not in a bad way, but in a, this is a known quantity. I know this person. I know what they're going to do there. I know that they're going to give me candid feedback in some way, like if I brought them in. And I think the same thing would apply. Like, I know a uh, recent topic Kip and I have been going back and forth on with, uh, with Dolby Engine, right? Is, so we bring up Dolby Engine, and the first thing Kip says is, I don't like what your lawyers are doing. I don't like what your accountants are doing. <laughs> Right, and uh, and so and his his thought is, well, I've got a lawyer and I've got an accountant that I know, you know, I'm going to do the things I want. They're going to speak the language I want. They're going to give me the reports. They know exactly what reports I want to see. They know, you know, like they know exactly how I like to structure these types of things. So I very much understand why he, he would want that, right? Um, and uh, and that's I think probably a very natural reaction that a lot of people would have, right? It's much easier for him if this same, if all the deals work the same way and he trusts those things. He's already gone through all this time to pick out these good people that he knows he wants to work with. He wants to put those into every company that he can, right? And that's yeah, that's fair. I mean, and I'd say so. And did you do it? No, not yet. So, which is fine. Um, and, and I would say relative to. But we like, really seriously considered it, right? Like we still are. Like just it's just that obviously those are, those are other relationships we have. No, so I'd say that. the service-oriented companies, for sure, it's known quantity, we know how they work, there's a lot of template and stuff that's good, just in terms of easy to look at 10 things that all look the same versus, versus you know, different ones. But if it was a, let's say it was a salesperson who really knew how to sell this one particular product in an enormously scalable way and actually had done it before and was somebody we knew really well, you know, that's a whole different thing relative to the yeah. impact to the business. That's going to make a big, big difference. And, that, and that's where, you know, you know, honestly, I think the email I got back from Josh is, no, I haven't done it, I really not want to do it right now. I'm like, man, well, all right. I still think it's the right thing to do, but not a battle and remotely I choose to, to, to take on. If this sort of salesperson that I think could inflect the business was, you know, that'd be one where like, no, let's all go to lunch, let's go get this guy, I want you to meet him, I think this is huge. Um, You'll, you'll, most investors, you'll never ever find forcing something to happen. Um, it's bad behavior. So what you don't necessarily get from investors is um, what you shouldn't get, unless the company is starting to fail. Frankly, is prescriptive behavior because that just takes all the accountability away from the company. If you have an investor or a board member that says, you know, go take a left turn at the next light. Um, you take a left turn at that light and you run into a, a, a car, you know, ultimately it's not your investor's fault because they said go do it and you did it. So what investors need to be able to do is to set up guardrails, set up, you know, suggest, um, recommend, um, you know, offer up potential networks of folks for you to, to interview. But the moment they sort of trip over the I told you to go do that, you're in a you're in a bad spot. So you this is exactly why going out, getting recommend or getting references, talking to previous companies that have had that investment uh, from that particular investor, what their behavior is in the good and the bad situations is so important because you need to make sure that you're held accountable, but still fundamentally in control of running your company. Because ultimately, that's the right. Yeah, you know, your investor is not the expert in your company. You are, and they need to hold you accountable for doing what you say you're going to do. But you got to go do that. So how do you feel when how do you feel when the investor fires you? How do you, how do you feel when the investor fires you? Well, the only thing I can say is I hope you know. Hopefully, two things. One is investors should never fire anyone in a company except the CEO. In my opinion. Um, second thing I'll say about that is if that CEO is surprised, that investor screwed up um, because there is a very simple black and white sort of expectations that the board and the investors have with the, the CEO, and that's their interface. Um, you can, as an investor or board, you can be invited into lower tiers of the company, 
or you might have relationships with lawyers in the company, but you need to do a good job of um, being disciplined about empowering your leader, your CEO, to sort of manage the, the day to day operations of that. And sort of dipping into that organization is bad behavior, in my opinion. And if you do that, you're sort of setting yourself up for a bunch of other problems. If your CEO has to get fired and it comes as a surprise, um, there's a there's a history of bad behavior that's happened not only on the CEO but on the investor side as well um, that sort of led up to that moment because there's no there should be no ambiguity about what the expectations were there should be no ambiguity about what um, you know where the uh, I think we have a problem I know we have a problem what the heck are we going to do about this problem sort of <coughs> escalation starts to happen and so um, you're not going to feel good. Nobody ever feels good. The investors don't feel good. It has to come down. But if it winds up being the kind of thing where all of a sudden, you know, the CEO is like, whoa, where did that come from? Yeah, the CEO may be failing, but the investor failed a little bit there as well. Yeah. One last thing on the, on the we talked about the lawyers and accountants thing. Just one more, I'll just make sure I can hit the, the very, if it wasn't meant as a negative comment, one more very positive part is, Kip can give me a perspective because he sees he's got 14 different companies he knows what all their accountants look like and all their lawyers look like. And so it's not just, I want to use my guy, but it's also like, no, 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 I know what these look like. That's not a part. You know, that's not what we, that's not, a, that's, you can expect more from that. Or you can get better price than that. Or, you know, all kinds of other things. Like price is important. We actually cut a deal with one of the service providers that says anybody who's below this amount of revenue, you need to give them the, the Silverton deal, which is a super discounted set of services because typically if you're below this revenue, you've only raised a certain amount of money and you can't afford to pay you know, big company fees to, to accountants and lawyers. And so, yeah, that is one of the things that you, you could, that's an actually an interesting question. You know, what else yeah. What else can you do for me? Have you got deals cut with other folks? Have you got folks that you can paratroop in and help me set up my books and QuickBooks and board reporting for finances? Which is a side note, generally not where early stage companies are spending a predominant amount of time. Um, that's, and they should, they should have something because they need that. What do you think about incubators that take equity? Incubators to take equity? Yeah. Well, I'm biased in answering that question because I work with, with Capital Factory. Um, I think um, what I'd like to believe is that anybody that ever goes through that program looks over their shoulder and goes, gosh, darn, that was totally worth the equity that I spent during that program. Um, and I would imagine, do we ever do autopsies and, and ask everybody if they thought it was worthwhile? Yeah. What's what's the average response? I mean, it's, I have I, I to recognize that they're telling me it, so there's probably some bias there too. Yeah, but generally yeah, so it's positive. Very, very positive. Yeah, people. I, mean, honestly, I think. I always feel like it's worth it. So I think um, the answer is, oh my God, we got so much. We got so much done over this period of time. We never, you know, we, we wouldn't have done a quarter of this in that period of time if we had. Not this. I think if it's, I think if it's a fixed, finite amount, um, like Capital Factor does, it's. It is a very small price to pay for having the herbs of energy spent on the business over that period of time. Um, so capital factory takes half the company, or where we get we get actually we get fifty one percent, so we have control in <laughs> 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 Yeah, for the for the, um, could, you, could you please say the number? What is the number? So which number? Okay, five percent. How much five. or something? Is five. Five Five percent for twenty five thousand dollars. And all the services and people and process and all that kind of stuff. And I don't. I, and honestly, I haven't sat down and Josh probably has the chart as to what people do and across different tech stars and one company or whatnot. But in general, I mean, I think the same. it's probably yeah, it's probably in the same ballpark. I think you've got to decide. Uh, you know, you know, how would I how would I think through? I would. I can't remember how long ago. So yeah, I'm so old. Um, it's, I think it's a, it's a pretty personal choice. I think you're gonna get, you are gonna get accelerated. You're gonna get accelerated in a bunch of, in a bunch of ways that you expect, probably a bunch of ways you don't expect. Just in terms of being exposed to how this thing works or how that thing works. And so if you feel like you've got um, some blind spots and you feel like you want to go through a process where you have access to a set of resources that ultimately is what you make of it, you can sit around and on your butt for an entire summer. If you go through a thing, give up five percent of your company, and get, you know, a one out of it. You can do the same exact thing and, and really 
suck all the air out of the room and get 100 out of it as well. And so I think if you are predisposed to take advantage of that, I think it's a no-brainer. And I don't care which one you're talking about. Um, I think if you're sort of kind of not sure if you're going to go whole hog and, and really exert the energy to go take advantage of everything you can possibly take advantage of, you know, you, you may not, that may not be the best way for you to spend your time. Um, but the same is true in this class. Probably in life. <laughs> Yeah. I didn't have a comment to follow up on that. But they may own five percent of your company, but you still own a hundred percent of that experience for the rest of your life. For sure. Because most people are here younger than I am. That experience is probably worth more than that five percent. I mean, don't forget to you know defend the population. You may own zero five percent of your company, but that experience doesn't matter. Well, the, I mean I think especially if you take advantage of startup only gets three percent of your company. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so what else do you give up? Obviously you're giving up some percentage of your company. That's the obvious part. Yeah, so you're giving away the most, cash is commodity, right? Cash is commodity. So you're giving up the, the scarcity, which is equity. Um, that's, that's the trade-off. Um, you hopefully get all the other stuff that comes with the investors. Um, you know, honestly, I don't, you know, it's easy to say I give up some control. Um, but the only time you ever really give up con control, like, can I go do what I want to go do? Um, is in, in the only time you get told no is in the case where it's it's the data says that's a bad idea and you're still wanting to go do that. Most most of the time, what control means is you have a set of investors that have a set of rights by virtue of making their investment that are able to affect you know. A particular voting structure that they may be able to influence, or a particular veto that may they may be able to have, but in, in no case does anybody sort of go into that trying to exercise that control. Those are set up almost universally in the negative case, as things bad start to happen. As the, as if the company is growing according to plan, there's there's no such thing as control. But investors are going to look at you and they're going to go, okay, well. Are you going to go from this to this? And we're like, well, here's the plan. And you're like, okay, go get it. And you know, if you're roughly speaking, you know, going forward, there's there's no control that investors want to exert because you're you're you're, you're the expert executing against your plan and your company. And if you look, if you think about just Silverton, and we're small. Um, now I've got 14 companies. If you're doing what you say you're going to do and everything's going great, <laughs> the last thing I want to go do is go get in your way. Um, you know, I want to. Call me if you need anything. Um, otherwise, keep going. And so control winds up being uh, the kind of thing that happens when I would like to issue, um, you know, 17% of the company to my uncle. You're like, well, that requires board approval, and your uncle's not even an employee here. I don't think that makes sense. You know, th there's the board's going to veto that. They're going to say no. So there's there's things that don't allow craziness to happen. But in general, it's not designed to sort of take, you know, I'm going to go run this business in a rational, smart way based on the best data that I have um, out of anybody's hands. The investors aren't good at running companies. That's the, the definition um, of, a, of an investor. They're an investor. They're not an operator. So that, that's the spirit of it. But what are the specific contracts? There are contractual, you know, it's, it, when you say you give up control, well, it's not like the board decides everything that happens in the company, the CEO decides that, but the board can fire the CEO. So that's how they control everything that goes on the company yeah. so that at one point. What other co would be common things that almost every investor would get? So one of them would be potentially right, deciding um, you know, that you can't issue more stock. So if you want to go raise more money, you have to get them to be on board. Issuing options, anything having to do with equity, issuing options, raising new, selling more equity for more money, that's a good thing. Um, Generally speaking, hiring um, you know, executives, officers of the company, the board wants to be involved in, much below that, not really. Um, you'd like to imagine that they're executing against the plan that says we're gonna hire five, and they hire five, not 15. Um, there's certain voting thresholds that come along with uh, a sale of the company, change of control. Um, so like in the case of you take uh, too much money from a big VC that wants you to have the $100 million exit, and you decide, someone offers you 20 million, and you're like, you know what, I think I want to sell the company. And so you go, 
And that might be one of those cases yeah. where your interest, when you're saying your interest might not be aligned, where the VC might say, no, I don't want to let you sell the company. I want you to keep running. Try to make it worth $100 million. Yeah, D true. So does everybody understand that the rough math that Josh said, if I raise 20 and somebody comes along and offers me 20 or whatever, and I want to sell the company, and the investor's just like, I, I just gave you, you know, you've raised 20. I'm not, I'm not going to make any increment on top of that. Um, I don't know what you now, but you just, I'm not going to make enough, like the 20 million dollars. I'm not going to make enough, but, but my, my point more than anything on that particular um, topic is you should, you know, that's a conversation that you have way before you get to um, somebody making a 20 million dollar offer. So like when you go take, when you go raise the next round, let's go say you raise 20 million dollars and you do it at a 40 million dollar valuation, <laughs> so you raise 20 on top of 60, because most money is 40 to 60, so you're selling a third of the company. Um, and they're like, okay, you know, you want to sell it for, you know, 40 less than the post money valuation your last round. I mean, that, that makes no sense. Um, so if I give you this money in this round, you know, our expectations are that you're going to make a multiple of your last valuation, which is your pre money plus your money you raise, 40 plus 20, 60. Yeah, you know, I would like to make you know some multiple of that. Now, they may say, I'd like to make 10 times that, but you know, there's a range in there, and it's a rational conversation to have that says, look, you know, what are your expectations of an outcome for something like this company in this sort of market in the next couple few years? If they can't answer that question or they're not willing to, that's another one of those warning signs. But that's before you ever took that money. That's in the conversation where they're talking about, here's a term sheet, here's what I want to do. Um, if you ever get to the point where somebody offers you something, you're surprised by how your investor reacts to a particular number, I mean, it might be some fringe case on the very low end or the very high end of some, some range, but in, in the abstract, if you're surprised by that, that's you've missed <coughs> getting on the same page with your investor, and that should happen way before you take their money. Um, yeah, if you raise 20 on a $40 million valuation, they want to have a $6 billion company, it'd be nice to know that ahead of taking that money, because that's hard to do. That is a question back there first. Do you think that there would ever be a point where somebody offers you a hundred million dollars and you say you want to keep going and the VC's like, no, I don't, no, I don't want to keep going? It's rare, rare. Um, the, I can I can make up a scenario. <laughs> you chose money. You, you took money from a VC that has not done well in other investments and that they're they're at the end of this ten year life of a fund situation and all of a sudden. They're like, well, I'm either going to go out of business or I need to show something that shows that I've made some good investment somewhere. And somebody comes along and they're like, okay, $100 million. I can see a VC that's in that situation with very few wins at the end of the life of their fund, but they're sort of desperately looking for some proof that they're a reasonably good investor going, oh, there, that could be the thing that allows me to go raise the next fund or tell my limited to, the, to hang on a little bit longer or extend the life of the fund or something. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to say that never happens, but by and large, um, you can imagine that you know a good investor will follow what the management team wants to go do because the management team's heart is in it. Um, shit, we should go for it. If the management team's like, "Oh, holy crap, this is life-changing amount of money," you know, I'm going to sock away you know 12 million bucks after tax, and all of a sudden, you know. This is, I cannot not do this. And the investor's like, you need to, I'm gonna go veto this thing, you've gotta go do it. All of a sudden, you're, you know, all the wind's gonna go out of that management team's sales, they really wanna go do that, you start forcing them to do something you wanna do. That's just setting yourself up for never getting to that next. Yeah, you know, any company that goes through a set of value creation sort of get, creates value, they get to this, this plateau, then they have to make investments, they have to go into new markets, they have to develop a new product, and their valuation literally comes down, right? Because there's a lot of risk that they have to take. Yeah. And there's some period of time before they reach this next plateau of value. It's a very natural sort of thing. But this point is absolutely lower than that, that <laughs> plateau early on. And so if, if the management seems like, look, I'm done. Take the money off the table. And this investor, the investor says, no, don't do it. Let's keep going. It's very likely that you know, it's all going to come to a head when you're in this trough of trying to go do this next hard thing. Because it's, it takes innovation, it takes vision, it takes execution, and all of a sudden you're like, you know, you got a management team that's disincented or, or at least disappointed. And so that that is a recipe for failure. So 
I can imagine a scenario where they'd be like, no, take it, please. Um, the best behavior, the one that you would you would expect and, and hope that your investor would do is to go follow management's lead. Because if they want to go double down and go for it, that's freaking awesome. That's the best team you could ever imagine. You're like, look, this is selling too early. This is Mark Zuckerberg, right? How many times did he have a chance to sell out and he didn't? Um, and, and he's built a company that, while not liquid, suggests that he made the right decision a bunch of times. That took a bunch of freaking guts to go continue to double down and do what he's doing. Um, I don't know if I would have done it. Um, but could your investor force you to sell? I think you he could. Um, in general, it's very rare that in a company that's executing well in a rational set of sequential investments that those rights would be held by the investor. It's much more likely that the company is much older, it's raised a, a, a large number of rounds in a different set of ways, uh, it's gotten recapitalized a bunch of times, so that the investors have taken a lot more risk and it's not sort of a linear series A, series B, whatever, the company's <laughs> executing well. They just sort of ended up at the, yeah, we put in $40 million and it's been seven years and we own 80% of the company and <clears throat> You know, we're just in this situation where it's not sort of a rational evolution. And for sure, in those cases, the investors have the predominance of, of rights and control that said, look, you know, we've taken risk on top of risk on top of risk, and, and we can say yes or no at any time. But I think if you sort of, any, any company that sort of raises a, up into the right couple of rounds generally retains um, generally retains all the rights to sort of control that. The most an investor would have in, in general rational term sheets would be a veto power, and that's that's fair. That's fair. So in a simple deal, actually, they probably wouldn't, because they have the ability to say you can't do something, but they don't always, they wouldn't, I don't think, normally have the ability to say you have to do something. Um, the next level of complexity, of course, is you don't have one investor. Yeah. And sometimes they just Sorry? More than one investor. Surely you've had more than one investor. Well, yeah. I disagree. Yeah, yeah. So then, so then the only thing I'd say there is generally speaking, there is a lead investor and an investor that sort of in, involves themselves the most. And um, other investors tend to follow that lead investor. If they're, they tend to be local with their company. Um, there can be disagreement, but um, you know, it's it's situations vary. Um, there can be disagreement that sort of ends up in stalemates and vetoes, and there can be disagreements that end up in a very rational discussion with the right sort of data opinion causing the right decision to happen. It's hard to sort of you get autopsy a bunch of different scenarios, but generally speaking, how common is it that companies buy back equity from investors? Very uncommon. It's much more common that investors buy equity from employees. So, if, a, if an investor, if an investor um, likes what the company is doing, so when an investor makes an investment, typically they'll get preferred stock. It's called preferred because it has a set of rights associated with it that have some of this control um, and, and structure to it that we can get into, but um, it's a longer discussion. Um, and the employees have common stock, which um, in the if you, go, if you go public or you get bought, and all everybody's excited about it, those things collapse into preferred and common became the same stock, and it's all uh, everybody's treated according to the to liquidation preference. Um, I'm saying a bunch of stuff and probably needs explanation, but but if a preferred investor is really excited about a company. And let's say you're a founder of that, and you're like, well, I've got you know 20%. My co-founder's got 20%. Everybody else has got some. The investors like, well, I only have 20%. And I'm really excited about this. You know, you know, how how about I buy, you know, five hundred thousand dollars worth of your stock at some discount to preferred? Because generally speaking, preferred's worth more because it has the preferences associated with it. Common's worth less because it doesn't have the preferences associated with it. That works well for option prices and a bunch of other things. But typically, they'll say, like, we just raised this round of dollar. What if I buy some stock from you at 80 cents? Um, and I'll buy, you know, 5% of what you have, so you still have 15, but I get to get more 
because ultimately I'm excited and I think in the fullness of time things are going to work out well and this is all going to be the same class of stock anyway. Um, and so it's much more likely for those investors to start aggregating stock if you, like maybe you want to go buy a Ferrari, right? And they're like, okay, well, I'll buy 250 k worth of stock from you. Um, I, I'm excited about the business. If you want to sell it, um, I'm happy to bolster my position. That's 99% of the case. Generally speaking, you're raising money from investors because you don't have it, and so you're not going to have it to buy back stock from them anyway. And if you've got it because money's coming into the company through sales and whatnot, now the company might buy stock, but it's not going to buy it back from the investors typically. It'll be the one that retires stock from co-founders and whatnot. And the fun thing about that is you undilute, which begs the question of how we talk about dilution. Um, if the company buys stock back from the founders, you can undilute everybody by 5%. If you buy 5% from your co-founder, just have that stock go away. The company can do that. The individuals typically never do. So it's 10 of 8, and um, well, I'm, I, I hope Kip stays till 9. I, don't, I did not tell him to expect to stay till 9. So I want to make sure we get to two in particular questions. Um, we'll go as long as Kip wants to go. But one of them is this one, what are the kinds of venture capital? And the other one is the, how much money should I raise? Okay. So let's do this one and then jump to that. So like when you say what kind of different kinds of venture capital? And so what I have in mind when I put it up here was um, uh, angel, smaller firm, smaller fund, yeah. and larger fund. Okay, so we kind of talked about this a little bit before. Um, so in my opinion, the the spectrum of investors are, um, you know, bootstrap, which is I'm just we're using our own money, doing whatever we can do. We're not taking it from anyone else other than typically the founders of the company. That's all, all bootstrap. There's friends and family, which is ask the parents, ask the uncle, ask the aunt. Um, that's a lot like. Um, bootstrapping. There's angel investors, and in the angel investor spectrum, I really think there's kind of two categories. There's the typical in the angel, which you tend to find more in Austin, which is a wealthy individual who has a passion for a number of particular areas, like um, you know, they love the cloud, cloud computing stuff, they love IT stuff, they love um, you know, digital media startups. Um, and they'll tend to invest along the lines, if you're Josh, you know, an email startup, you know, that I'll invest along the lines of my expertise and passion <laughs> because maybe I can help the company, but at the very least, I, I can, I'm excited about, I understand the business and, and maybe I can help them. And, and I really, because I understand it so well, I really think there's a new opportunity and these guys are going to go get it. And so it tends to be a passion oriented investment. I'd say the first characteristic of that type of investor that I, that I think is consistent is um, they're smaller. I'd say most of those guys tend to, to those kind of angels tend to invest you know, 20,000 bucks to 200,000 um, bucks. And probably mostly on the lower end of that. And they typically don't write a second check. It's a one-time investment. They're, they're not gonna follow it on. They're not gonna, they're not gonna give you 20K and I go, oh, let me know when you need 20 more K. They'll be like, this is it, I'm out. Good luck, I hope you go do it. Um, they're probably hoping for a return, um, but in general, if they're rational, good angel investors, they kind of know the risks associated with this, and they'll try to help you, but they're probably not expecting a tremendous amount of uh, outcome, especially if they make any small investment. Then there's super angels, um, which is kind of a wacky word, but they're typically angels um, you know, Mike Maples, uh, Dave McClure, and there, there's a set of folks that have raised, and that started out behaving like the first group of angels, but have wound up raising other people's money like a fund, um, but they still tend to do deals in the style of an angel, which is, um, you know, in, in a pejorative way, described as spray and pray, which is like, here's 50K, here's 50K, here's 50K, see you later. Um, but in general, they don't tend to follow on. They still tend to do smaller deals. They can do a higher volume of deals because they bought, um, they brought in a, a fund, you know, usually 20, 20 to fifty million dollars in size, um, but they still don't tend to, to to behave like a venture capitalist in terms of really <coughs> reserving money for that investment. And and whether these guys do it in a convertible note structure, have we talked about structures yet. Um, so I wouldn't go, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't go into that. Okay, so there's different ways that you can put money in company. Um, just put a bookmark in the conversation that 
Angels tend to like convertible note structures, which is I'm not going to figure out anything about valuation or terms. I'm going to let the next investor do that. Um, there's more detail there, but that's the short version. And then there's there's venture capitalists that tend to say I'm going to figure out everything about the terms and the valuation. And any convertible note tends to follow that structure. Um, so angels tend to go in this defer the hard questions about valuation and terms, convertible note structure, um, even the super angels. Venture capitalists tend to invest more. Um, Silverton tends to invest 250K to two or $3 million in one chunk, and we tend to try to invest no more than seven or $8 million over the life of the company. Um, <coughs> we'll do that only, we don't do, we will not do a convertible note structure. We only want to get equity and set the terms uh, for that, and in general, we try to target ownership of the company, um, not really more than 33%, 33-35% of the company, but we also don't want to really go below 20%. Um, you know, we, we our model says we should get to 33. Um, we're a little over, that's fine. We really can't afford to do, um, in terms of just the time and effort we spend on every deal, we really can't do that if we own less than 20% of the company. Um, just because we can't, we don't have half time. We don't have half halfway in on a company. We either are all in or we're not. And if, we, if we're all in and we're going to do a deal, we kind of need to get close to our target. Um, but we're small, so in the venture capital spectrum, where the angels are, you know, small angel, working individually, no fun, doing one-off deals. Super angels are, got a fun, doing a bunch of deals, still don't follow on. The venture capital world is um, small fun, boutique, you know, small fund is probably 70 to $200 million, and a larger fund is sort of up to a billion, uh, and, and maybe even more. Um, the behavior and the structure of the terms between everybody in the venture capital spectrum tends to be about the same. There's, there's tweaks and, and things that you can change, but at this point in time, they've pretty much standardized on, there's a term sheet on my blog, that's a basically a cookie cutter term sheet for what a venture capital firm would offer you. Um, that's the kind, that's the different kinds of, of capitals. Or, you know, anything any questions or anything? You know, well, both might, you guys have. I might be asking the question in the sort of market, and I am the one to accept that. But I still don't understand the difference of ownership of that an angel investor wants versus venture capital. That's my biggest question about everything. We're talking angel about. investor is okay. So let's talk about convertible debt for a second. So convertible debt is a structure that basically says. If I'm going to give you a convertible note for your company, I'm going to fund you using a convertible note for your company, and I'm going to give you $100,000. Um, what that, in essence, is, is a loan. That loan matures over a certain period of time. It has a certain interest rate associated with it. Um, there's a cap on, on how much you can raise under that note. Um, but the, the interesting thing about that is I don't want to get paid back. And anybody who really gives you a convertible debt note to fund your company would actually like it to convert into equity. They're, they're taking, I mean, if you think about it in the most simple sense, they're taking a risk on you, pretty big risk in terms of investing in a company. They don't want 5% back over a year compounded. They want, they're taking an equity-oriented risk. They want an equity-oriented return, at least I do. So like what they really want to have happen is this, this this loan, this debt, to convert into equity. Um, when does it convert? Well, it converts when somebody invests in your company at a certain level, like let's say a million bucks. If somebody came along later, a year later, and invested a million bucks in your company, that hit the threshold. Whoever invested that would get to set the terms under which that convertible debt converted into equity. And typically, the only thing that ever gets set in a convertible debt note is what the discount is to the convertible to the to the equity price that was paid. So typically, let's call it 20%. If I gave you a convertible debt note at a 20% discount, somebody came along a year later and invested money in your company at whatever value, um, I would convert to the same equity structure that they had, but it would be as if I gave you 120,000 as opposed to 100,000. Um, so by definition, an angel investor is, is overtly saying, I don't, I don't know and I don't care what percent of the company I'm going to own. 
I know that it'll be at a discount to whatever somebody pays in the future, because as a side note, I put money in first. I get some benefit for that. Um, but whatever it is, I'll get 100 and, in this case, 20K is a 20% discount of whatever that is. And good luck, I hope we get that. If not, then you have a debt obligation to that, that person whenever it comes to due. So we actually went and talked about it. Um, <laughs> As soon as we left, then we're talking about the other three things that you didn't want us to do. Um, so that's the spectrum as far as I see it in terms of t ways to raise money. I wouldn't call the first two bootstrapping or, or friends and family really venture capital. Um, and, and way at the other end of the spectrum, I'd call private equity, where you're really trying to buy, generally speaking, more distressed assets. And it's kind of a different discussion as well in terms of growth. Funding and growth equity, like we're talking about. I was say something about subsequent rounds. So you just talked about the first round. But yeah. The second. Yep. 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 It's a good point. So, <coughs> so you got to get your first money somehow. And and honestly, working at the at this end of the spectrum and with your first money is a is a pretty common way to go. As things mature, um, certainly the, the the best way for things to proceed is to go further. You know, down the spectrum into more um, formal types of capital like venture capital. Why? Because one, um, you certainly don't want to have, you'd like to minimize at some point the number of investors that you have to deal with. And if you're only raising from friends and family or angels, uh, and eventually you need um, you know, $3 million, by definition, you're gonna have to cobble that together with, with a whole bunch of, you know, I'd call it cats and dogs, to sort of get to the level to go fund your company. Um, what you'd like to do is go with, with investors that have an increasing interest in facilitating the growth of your company and understanding that it takes more capital to grow more more quickly. And so, in general, going from an angel or bootstrap to uh, a smaller or a VC firm makes a ton of sense. Going from a VC firm back to, after you've raised money from a VC back to an angel, almost never happens. So what you really need to find is sort of the next phase of VC to follow on, increase the valuation, give you more money, um, you know, hopefully uh, completely carry forward the terms that were originally set so that everybody's on the same page. Um, but, but you sort of scale up into the larger and larger firms because in general, if, if your business is growing, you need a larger and larger um, amount of capital to continue to build that company. What it took to get from where it, from, you know, Two folks and a dog in a garage to you know a million bucks in revenue is going to be less than what it takes to get from a million bucks in revenue, you know, with a hundred employees to you know fifty million bucks in revenue. That that could be you know two orders of magnitude more than what it took. So you want to go up the food chain in terms of venture capital and the firm's abilities to write checks and, and whatnot. Is that fair? Anything to add? Ben, did you want to? Yeah, I did put my uh, post in the group, uh, the Facebook group, so you can read that. I, I, I have uh, seven species of angels that I described in there. Ah, okay. Uh, you're all yeah. welcome to read that, and uh, if you have an answer any questions about that, I don't want to take away from the other time here. But, uh, I'm just, at this point, I, I mean, I'm going to either, I prefer more questions than, than continuing to ramble, but I'm happy to go to the next one, too. Okay, so, so there's one more I wanted to make sure to get to while he's here, and then you can be free for all the questions for the skip wants to do it to stay. Um, so that was, how do I decide how much money it is? So that's a really hard one. First principle, the least amount possible. Um, Which should sound familiar, right? That was my, ten, ten, my starting tips. Thing. So, <coughs> it's, a, it's an interesting question because it's not, it's not the easiest um, one to answer generically. Um, There's a inherently subjective, uh, subjective on the part of, the, of your investors, uh, assessment of you taking your, your execution, your progress, your products, your customers, taking risk off the table for any company. Um, and, and I talked about these sort of plateaus that you reach in terms of you know, first customer, you know, first product, first customers, you know, second market, second product, you know, second set of customers. There's, there's just different plateaus that you reach in terms of proof points in the business, um, value in the business, uh, defined by any number of things based on the characteristics of your business. 
as you're trying to go take and use other people's money, the best thing I, I can sort of guide you generically to think about is you, you want to get from one plateau to the next plateau. What you don't want to do is raise too little money so that you're sort of stuck in a trough. You don't have enough to prove out the next product. You don't have enough to prove out the first product um, to get the first set of customers. Or maybe you're raising your second round. You don't have enough to get to the next market, the next product, the next set of customers. Um, and that's a, it's a simple statement, but what's, what's buried in that as you start to execute against your, your plan is a diabolically complex set of costs um, that you have to begin to think through in order to characterize how much time, how much money it's going to take to get from the, the peaks of those plateaus to, to the next. So for example, um, if you created a product that you thought, um, Socialware, let's make it real. Socialware is a company that, that created a product that SaaS based, it's all hosted in the cloud. They thought they're going to sell it. Very easy to consume. You type in your Twitter, your Facebook thing, it starts archiving your, your social media stuff, which is necessary in financial services so that you don't get sued by FINRA um, if you're a regulated rep of some sort. Trust me, that's all true. Um, they thought they are going to do some email marketing, some other stuff, and that the customers were going to, you know, webinars and a bunch of different things. All of a sudden, customers were organically going to show up and consume this product because it was obvious, it was easy to consume. Type in your credit card, um, and all of a sudden, we're going to start getting subscription revenue from a growing number of customers because, you know, they're just going to come here and start behaving that way. Well what it took to market that, what it took to, to sell it, which is kind of self-service, um, what it took to go get the next 100 one of those um, was modeled and sort of characterized. And that cost in order to go from, say, no customers to a couple few hundred, which would be a pretty good proof point relative to that product and its adoption in the market, was sort of modeled out and, and they started executing. Well, you know, financial services is a very, um, Cautious market. Uh, social media is a very new thing. Most of the social media, most of the financial services companies um, turn off Facebook and Twitter when you're inside the network. So the, their solution to protecting folks isn't to sort of adopt a solution to do it, it's to shut it down so you can't even do it in the first place. Right? So there's education that has to happen. Right? Okay, well, here's why you need Twitter and Facebook it's because you're trying to sell insurance or, or financial services stuff to consumers, and all the consumers are hanging out on these social networks. Don't you want to go talk to them where they're hanging out? Like, oh, okay, well, maybe that makes sense. It's not primetime television anymore or something. So, um, so this thing that we thought was going to be this, this expensive and take this amount of time suddenly took three times longer. And it, and it, couldn't, it wasn't self-service. It actually took somebody going out to Fidelity and saying, hey, let me help you understand this business case. And so what the sales motion was and the time it took in a sales cycle um, was very different than what was originally modeled. And it actually became much longer, much more costly. Um, and that was not built into the initial assumption. And so, so what, you know, if Socialware had raised an amount of money predicated on the plan to go sell that product the first time, they would have run out, they would have failed. Um, it would, it would have taken too long. They wouldn't have got any customers. And if they would have raised that amount of money and went to the investors like, well, you know, we tried and this model didn't work. But we, what we think we need to do is raise another million or two and go do a direct sales model of these same guys because we really think we've got a great product. The investors would be like, well, how am I supposed to believe that? You haven't sold any of it. You're like, I just trust you. You've got a great product. You don't have any proof points. You, know, you, you tried and failed. Um, that's not, you know. I can imagine that you're going to go try again, but what, what proof do I have that that's going to work? And so, you know, figuring out the cost to serve a market, figuring out the sales motion that's required, um, doing this in an iterative <coughs> way so that you can apply as much data as you possibly can, are the data points that start to get fed into the model with enough buffer for headroom and mistakes and error that allow you to begin to characterize the time and the money that it takes to get from these the tops of these, these value inflection points from one to the next. Um, and if that sounds complicated, it is. It's absolutely freaking hard. Um, and it's very different from one business to the next. Um, because you may have a product that can be sold very easily, or you may have a product that's extremely valuable, but it takes huge amounts of effort and time to go sell it. 
but you've got to characterize that well enough so that you can be funded through <coughs> proving out that your business works. Um, an investor is going to give you some, is going to give you as much credit as they can to based on the data that you have. But if you came to me and you said, like, I have no idea what it costs, we talked about this a second ago. If I have no idea what the cost to serve my market is and get this product sold, it'd be really hard for us to go, well, we don't know how much you really should be raising. If you don't really know how to take this product to market, you know, and, and therefore how long it takes and how much it costs, you know, how do I know you're not off by an order of magnitude in terms of how much you should raise right now? Get enough proof points so that you can characterize that. And whatever you model, in the absence of data, will be wrong. It's not gonna be right. But you've got to start so that you can test those assumptions, you can test that data, you can realize that was a good one and that was a bad one, we're gonna fix this. Um, and if you don't do that, then there's no, there's no way that you're gonna iterate yourself to a, a model that is valid and can be used to sort of characterize the time and effort and cost to get from tip to tip to tip. You ever have companies that come in and don't really know how much they need, but you really like their, their ideas, so you'll give them experts that you know in the field who can help them out? Yep, yep, yep. on rare occasions, on rare occasions. If it's a if it's an unbelievably good team in an unbelievably good market, and they've got a product that is um, sort of on the verge of getting fleshed out, and we really think that, that just with a little <coughs> bit of um, effort that could get to that point, uh, we'll take a leap. It's a it's in the minority case. It doesn't happen very often. The way we typically do that is called a tranche investment. We'd say, look, you know, you probably need a million and a half bucks based on our belief of your model, but you just don't have any data yet. Here's a small chunk of that. 100, 200, 300, 400 k. You know, it's going to take you this amount of time. Let's agree that we want to try to prove out these things in this amount of time. If we do, then let's do the rest of the investment. If we don't, then let's agree that, that you've got more stuff to figure out. Um, that's a way to de-risk it for us and that still let the company play out what their beliefs are and get that data. It's just really, that's that's a that's an earlier stage investment. It's a little bit more appropriate for an angel than it is a venture capital firm, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, it's in the minority of cases. We had a speaker like a couple weeks ago um, saying that uh, like agility and going quickly and making these decisions quickly was important. So um, how do you feel about reaching these plateaus? Should we have a lot of smaller plateaus? Or, I mean, every, every company's going to decide that, of course. But, I mean, err on the side of smaller or err on the side of, you know, just take the big hits with the large amounts of money if you think you can do it. <coughs> Yeah, I'm just trying to answer generically. Um, I think the nature of iteration is is constantly picking smaller plateaus on the on the way to something that that generically anybody could look at. And say, oh, okay, you've proven out this piece of your business. So I'm I'm a fan. I think in the abstract of you know here's six things that we've got to go prove yes or no. Let's make decisions. Let's test, iterate. You know, prove that it's true, prove that it's not true quickly so that we can con continue to do that. I think, I think that is the essence of execution. I still think that there's, along that path, right, you can draw a line through one data point in any direction, right? So I think you need a path to some, some point where the outside, <coughs> uneducated, you know, investor, you know, with the attention span of a squirrel can assess that your business is, is successful and, and sort of operating the right way, your business model's starting to be proved out. That's sort of a macro, that's, a, that's sort of the summation of all those little points along the way. So you know, I still think you have to get to something where you can convince outside folks that your business is working. I think there's a bunch of little steps to get there. I think that is what you have to execute on internally, and I think you get there efficiently by each of those little iterations, but you still have to cross that bar that subjective bar, unfortunately, uh, to convince people to write checks and part of the way. So you said like the least least amount of money possible is what you want to aim to to do when you're raising money. Um, if you start out your business like with a bootstrap, like what are some of the signs that maybe like bootstrapping is not working anymore and you need to actually look for like angel investors and VCs? If you sold so much crap that you have to, you, you cannot support all the customers that you've signed up and are paying you, that's a good indication. 
Um, if you have one sales guy who's so busy signing up deals that you know they can work 10 hours a day and you know they're signing up you know 10 customers a month and they're doing it every month and holy smokes we can't you know we should go hire 10 of those guys because then we could do 100 of those a month yeah you know, those are the when you've got enough proof points in the business that you believe you found elements of your model that are repeatable that's a really good indication that it's time to add water and grow it. Um, if you're, you know, one sales guy sells nothing one month and then they go over here and they try the same amount of effort and they sell 15 of them and then it goes back down to two, you know, what are you going to scale there? What are you going to, you don't want 15 of those guys. Um, and so that's not a repeatable process. So I think you have to look for things that start to exhibit a pattern of repeatability where you can characterize within that repeatability What's the stuff that's causing it to scale? I've got a dude who came from a company, I've got a guy who came from Solar Winds who has an inside sales model, who knows how to make 50 calls a day uh, and sell packaged software. Interestingly enough, that applies to my business, you know, which is very different from Solar Winds, but in a very similar way. He seems to be doing you know, as good a job at that. Okay, that's something I need 15 of. And they become effective over three months period of time, I don't have three months of working capital, I need to go get that inside the company so I can go hire those 15 guys and scale them up. I mean, that's how, when you can characterize what it is that is scalable inside something that you find to be repeatable, that's a great time to, to apply money, whether it's money that you have already or find it somewhere else. And you have to have data that says it's truly repeatable. Otherwise, it's gonna be a rough investment. What happens if your fume day is approaching and uh, your investors don't feel you have enough proof points? So yeah. Not that. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so, a couple things. I think you've got to. I mean, ultimately, the answer to that question is you need to find investors. There's financing risk that you that a company has always. Um, what Bob's talking about is what if your investors have said, I've written my check, your angel investor said, I've written my check, um, that's what I can do. You need to go find your next investor, whether it's an angel or a venture capitalist. You know, you've sort of assessed, okay, I've got one or two or three customers, but I really need 20 or 30 in order to sort of prove that I've got something that can scale, and you've only got 10. Um, I mean, ultimately, that's a tough spot, and I think the answer to the question is you've got to go find an investor that gets and, and appreciates where you are relative to, you know, and is able to take more risk relative to, you know, if you had 100 investors or 100 customers, I think any investor would say, okay, you're starting to prove it out. Your original <laughs> investor said, I've written the check that I can write. You know, it's up to you at that point to, to begin to look for uh, an investor that sort of can take the onesie twosie or, or 10 customers that you have to scale and the risk that you've you know, taken out of the company um, and begin to invest in that. Or um, what you, the, the reality is, or you have um, less leverage in your business and what you can do is you can, you can go back to that angel and go, look, you know, what that 20% discount was before, you know, I need another 100K to go get the next set of customers. I'm willing to give you a 40% discount on that, that investment, but you get the business, you're, you're, you know me, you're already involved. You know, I really think that next inflection point, you know, I'm just shy of the top of that hill. I need to get there. Um, it takes a little bit of leverage, you know, out of your hands relative to, to raising that next round. But you can always go back to your, your existing investors, whether it's a VC or an angel, or what have you, you just wind up opening yourself up to a little bit more um, negotiation in terms of, you know, is it a round that's flat? Is it a round that's up? It could be a round that's down, um, if it's really bad. Um, but in, in general, what you'd like to do is go find an investor that can, that can sort of get where you are and right size that investment. Um, that's a tough spot, It's uh, which is why, you know, trying to be as precise yeah, it's a delicate balance, right? You want to raise as little as possible, but you don't want to run out so that you're in a situation. That's crappy. It's a crappy situation to be in. 
But that's the balance that you have to sort of sign up for. So do you want to have a little bit of buffer, a little bit of headroom? For sure. You know, do you want three years of buffer? No. Because everything takes longer, for sure. Um, but, you know, look, if this was easy, there wouldn't be a class on it. There wouldn't there'd be a thousand startups every, you know, formed every day. It's hard. It's really, truly hard, but super rewarding. Um, what if your company fails? Okay. In, in which, in, just in general? Yeah, do you owe them? You're not, you're not, uh, you, you might owe mom and dad. Um, sort of depends on that conversation. Um, in general, for a venture capitalist, you don't, you're not personally, you know, never say never, but in general, the deals we do, the deals I've ever done in my career, you're not personally on the hook for the money that you raise. Um, it could turn out that in the, the worst case scenario where you just wind down the company because it was the, whatever, bad things happen. Um, you're not going to raise any more. Yeah, there's no, uh, there's sort of no customer support. You're sort of done. Uh, in the wind down scenario, typically what you'll do is um, try to sell the assets of the company. Um, absolutely a fire sale, pennies on the dollar kind of stuff. And that will go to pay back as much as you can, uh, whether it's intellectual property or office chairs. Um, you know, the investors that, that made money, but you're not, you're not personally on the hook now. Your reputation, your brand is an entrepreneur. Um, is certainly on the hook. That's that's the biggest personal liability by and large. But um, in the worst case scenario, you wind up um, you wind up selling the assets, taking the cash you have, and the assets and from the uh, whatever's left in the company, and distributing that back in a pro rata proportionate to what the investors have, have put in. And it happens. And that, in fact, it happens commonly. Um, but. And the people investing know that that can happen. Yeah. So like, yeah, we're not, nobody's jumping up and down and excited about it, but it's not anybody's first time to see that happen. Hey, so Kip, since we're trying to keep everybody uh, enthusiastic and excited, why don't we change the topic and talk about like, going public? Okay. <laughs> we could do that. Should we talk about going public? I want to depress everybody. Over this. <laughs> no, I don't want to depress anybody. Was I being depressing? I've never wound down a company. You don't need to wind down a company. I wouldn't want to go public either, though. That's kind of depressing. You have <laughs> never wound down a company? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, boy. I've had, I've had, I've had, I've had yeah. failures. Um, so take that, take a scenario where I have a company that didn't work. Um, you can develop enough assets or have enough cash in the bank to where somebody will buy you or you can buy somebody and then go on to live another, another life. So certainly one of the companies that I, uh, I did that didn't have a great outcome raised um, too much money, um, raised $20 million when it should have raised by two or three to start with. Um, and so as, as the market didn't mature as fast as we wanted it to, um, we're pretty pragmatic about this isn't working. So we can either reconstitute this, or we can um, look, investigate other plans. And at that point, there's still millions of dollars in the um, in cash in the company. And so um, this was compounded by it being right at the very end of 2008, beginning of 2009, which is financial and um, And so, you know, having a whole bunch of millions of dollars in the bank, there's that was interesting, right? You could. There are a bunch of things for sale and a bunch of companies who needed cash. And so in that case, there's no wind down whatsoever. It wound up being unfinancially interesting. There's another little interesting uh, term. So let's say I raised 20 million bucks. If the liquidation preference, which is one of the terms of a preferred stock, is one, one times, which it should be by and large, that's, that, that's fair. Um, you would say the overhang that we had in preferred um, in preference to that company is $20 million, which rounds off to for $20 million worth of stuff coming, you know, getting sold for or bought, you know, in particular bought for you know, $20 million or less, means all that money goes to the investors. So the overhang from the investors for that preference that they put in one times their money, the first $20 million goes to them. So if we're in the middle of playing around with half that, for example, buying or selling something worth $10 million, 
that's well under the bar of the preference relative to what was raised for that coming. So it's very easy to imagine in terms of a failure. I'd say it's a failure from my perspective because it was below the level where the people who are running the company who had common stock, there was any financial impact upside, one way or the other. Um, doesn't mean at all, so it doesn't mean that our equity wound up being worth nothing. It, means it doesn't mean the company, per se, got wound down. Actually, it's still up and running and doing fine. Um, but that's a, it was a financial transaction. Um, some, some people might have stayed with that company. Some people might not have. It would have been a deal that was done on the other side of that purchase or acquisition. Um, but the company's persisted, um, either inside of another one or by itself. Actually, I don't remember how it went down. But um, um, didn't wind down. But that's because there's enough asset built up cash or technology or product or customers or otherwise that it deserved to live on in some form or fashion. There's some places where you don't develop enough critical mass there where it just gets wound down and you sell the office chairs and whatnot and that happens as well. But yeah, there's doesn't mean I've never had a failure. I've had all sorts of failures in different dimensions. But the uh, the notion of winding stuff down is different than just sort of whether or not it was a good outcome and for who. So I think this is a more positive topic. So how do you give how do you how do you how do you give it to the investors? You know, you it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Can we turn off the videotape? Um, so um, how do you give it to other investors? To yeah, not you. <laughs> we'll never give it to you. So now I am. I'll tell you straight. You can give it to give it to give it to everybody. Um, investors are funny. Um, funny folks. There's a set of things that are very true. Um, while it's human nature, it's especially true for investors that they tend to want the thing they can't have. Um, if there's a deal that's getting done and they're not involved, that is like porn, salt on a snail. It's horrible. Um, yeah, that is a, doesn't mean that they're going to go do a deal. It certainly means that their interest level is peaked. Their, their desire to sort of get involved and understand what's going on is peaked. Their, their propensity to engage rapidly and deeply is as high as you'll find it. Um, so what does that mean tactically? Uh, first, most obvious thing is competition does wonders for everybody. Um, you will get, you'll get a deal done if you have one term sheet, by and large. You'll get the deal that you want to get done if you have two or more. Um, so having leverage by having a number of deals on the table simultaneously is the best place you can possibly be from an entrepreneurial perspective because um, because you have options and once you have options you can get well you know honestly that you know three times liquidation you know participating preferred term doesn't work for me even though I'd love to work with you because this other term sheet doesn't have that it's one time one time is not participating and so you know I'm sorry that. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna go with this unless we can work something out. Oh, hold on, we'll scratch that out right here. You know, and all of a sudden things start to happen because you have options, and so um, you absolutely get. You know, yeah. You know, how do you get leverage? Have competition. So easier said than done. What percentage of deals have competition? Not yours, just in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think. Investors. It's it's a low percentage. I say less answer. common. Yeah, it's more low. common. You get one dollar. <laughs> so you don't get to negotiate. You just have to take that. <laughs> and 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 there's certainly. I mean, there's a there's a delicate balance. Um, if you got a term sheet for me tomorrow, the likelihood of you being able to take a term sheet from Silverton and walk across the street to some West Coast firm and and say, I've got a term sheet here, but I really want to work with you. The likelihood of you developing another term sheet out of having one in the first place isn't a no. Is it's not? It's not a no-brainer, but it's higher. What percentage higher? I don't know. But it's it's more likely. And if it's a reputable firm, that percentage goes up. That's called shopping a deal, and and it is both. When you sign a term sheet, it's explicitly prohibited. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But the thing I would say is, and this is sort of just like best practices, behavior, ethics, um, you're kind of saying that you're not going to go do that. 
Um, it's, it is a reputational interesting sort of thing to decide how, what you do when that happens, if you wanted to go develop competition. Because ultimately, it is your business. You are trying to do the best thing for you and the company and a bunch of different things. Your, fidu your fiduciary responsibility is aligned with the company, and yet you are uh, sort of obligated not to shop that deal. And so developing that's competition, that's what you sign a term. Which will so, say in it, don't go shop this deal. Like, so developing competition at the point where you have a term sheet, but it's not signed, um, tends to be a very narrow window of time. Tends to be a, uh, something like if, if you came to me with a term sheet, you're like, hey, you want to do a deal? Um, I'd personally be reticent to sort of pop on that because it's also sort of an issue for me to go get in the mix where there's another firm that I might work with in the future, um, and I'm trying, I'm kind of screwing it up with them. And so, competition is the best thing you can get. Developing that in a transparent, rational authentic way is a very difficult thing to do. So lots of meetings, um, step convergently towards a point in time where you're trying to make something happen so you don't sort of take things and go somewhere else. You'd like to have a date where you're you're trying to say like, this is some place we're trying to get a, a set of things to happen. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky problem, but it is the most obvious way to get leverage. So the timing is really important with this, right? He said, you start off by saying, you know, getting multiple term sheets at the same time. And it's at the same time that it's so hard because this thing, especially because the VCs in general don't want you to do that. So there, there'll be some pressure in there where they'll give you a term sheet and they say, look, this is only good for a short amount of time because they don't want you to go shop around other people. So the best thing that you can do is you need to somehow try to get all these like you know stars to align such that they're all making you offers at the same time. And what that means is, while there's some caveats to this, because you generally there's a little bit of ramp up where you want to like test your message and talk to a couple investors first, but then you kind of like want to talk to as many people as you can all at once, right? And get as many conversations going and figure out which ones are real and narrow those down to getting a few real conversations going. And, on. and being explicit about what timing you're working towards is helpful. Like I'm expecting to get something in general from a number of firms on this date, three weeks into the future, and try to. So let's go around the room real quick. Uh, so it seems like VCs talk to each other, right? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, so like, why, why wouldn't, if somebody came to you with somebody else's term sheet, they were like, yeah, shop for me. Like, wouldn't you just pick up the phone and call them and be like, hey, what's the deal with this company? I mean, like, well, so I, I, if I, somebody did that with me, I'd be like, look, um, we're not going to do that. Because right. that's life short, and I might work with that firm, and you've got a term sheet, I think you should take it. I, I'm not going to. Other firms may or may not behave that same way. Um, and I'm not saying, like, I know a firm that does. I'm just saying it's a kind of an individual decision. Um, it's more likely to get into a situation where you talk to me, I got busy, I went out of town, you talk to another firm, they acted really quickly, you know, they gave you a term sheet, I got back in town, you're like, well, I've already got a term sheet. You're like, whoa, I was going to give you a term sheet. Um, and so then all of a sudden I'm sort of confronted with, uh, Okay, well, what do I do? And probably what I would do in that situation is I would pick up the phone and say, you know, I was sort of I'm interested in this company, with this other VC. You know, how are you thinking about this? Um, you know, are you looking for a partner in this? Do you want to, you know, do you want to work together on this? Because in general, it's, it's generally speaking reduces the, fi the financing risk for companies if you work together with another firm. Generally, each firm gets less of the company if you do that. So you have to sort of have this agreement between everybody. Be like, okay, well, we can let you in. That's good. Yeah, we have a good reputation. We could use your help. I'm I'm in this city. You're local. Okay, well, that'd be super helpful. We have somebody local. Okay, we'll make some room for you. Hey, why don't we ask the company if they're willing to take another million bucks, and then we can we can you know get a little bit more each, um, and they'll have more money. Maybe they'll do that. And then it kind of solves our problem. And so like that's a pretty likely scenario how that would play out. What I wouldn't do is sort of go, oh, well, here, and screw them. Here's my term sheet for $500,000 more valuation. Go tell them no. That's a, that's a hard way to live in this right, particular you, industry. This is with and without a signed term sheet. Well, I'm saying even, even in the, either way for me, if somebody came to you and you're like, I signed this term sheet, I'd be like, okay, well, you've kind of got a done deal. Um, to not do that, and I, and I wouldn't. In that case, I probably wouldn't pick up the, the phone and even call the firm. In that case, 
if you came to me and like I signed this term sheet, I'd still really like to work with you and blah, blah, blah. The most I'd probably do at that point is say, if you sign the term sheet, um, I don't want to be an asshole and sort of get in the middle of this. Why don't you go back to your firm and say, you know, I've been talking to this guy as well and I like working with them. Do you think, you know, is that, would you, would you work with them? And if so, why don't you call him? And then that'd be like, okay. But in that case, in the first case, I could pick up the phone. In the second case, you'd kind of have to go play that. Once you sign that, you're kind of in a gray area if you start playing the field. And it can get a little slimy, which isn't the best place to, to be. And like I said, you still have the fiduciary responsibility of the company in your hands, but you kind of already said you're okay with what they did. And so it's just, you know, it's one of those situations that you have to, you have to think deeply about what, how you would want to behave and be perceived in that. Because it's a very relationship-oriented business. So, are there other questions back here? You said that the window is very narrow. So two related questions. Exactly, or relatively, how big is that window? And does the window tend to get uh, longer as the amount of money goes up? Because I mean, you're thinking more and no, more about it. It might get shorter as the amount of money goes up. Um, it's usually um, a couple days. Like we don't want to be like I've, I've raised money from somebody on the West Coast who's like, "You want this term sheet? I want you to sign it before you leave." You're like, "Hey, Goodbye. okay, bye." <laughs> let me let me think about that. Um, and then you got to. I mean, saying buy outright is not not necessarily the right answer, and doing it's not necessarily the right answer. You have to, yeah. What if it's the best deal on the planet? Um, I think a couple days to, to sort of think through, you know, I want to talk it over with my team. I want to review it with my lawyer. I want to think through and maybe do some more due diligence on you with your firms and talk to people you've invested in and make sure I really want to sign up with you. Like a couple few days for that is completely fair. And anybody who's like, oh, like the person who did it to me, like, oh, why don't you sign this? Like, that's kind of a, kind of a bad way to go. I did. <laughs> <laughs> and as it turned out, um, yeah, that did. It was a good deal. So, not not necessarily the right behavior on their part, but it wound up being a good deal. Um, what cities are good for investing or being? A part I'm of sorry. This? What cities are good for being a part of this? I mean, you said that you have a you know a network of people here in Austin. Like, are there any other? Austin's places? the best. <laughs> uh, I mean, good for startups. Yeah. Um, I think you want there, there's sort of critical mass of stuff, right? You want investors, you want entrepreneurs, you want sort of established companies that you can steal talent and, and executives <laughs> from. I think you just need critical mass of stuff, and we've got it. New York, Boston has it. Um, West Coast, you know, San Jose, Valley has it. Do you find more hostile like behaviors in other places? What's that? Do you find more hostile behaviors like you can't leave this room without? And, you know, just like well, I, I wouldn't call it, I mean, it might come off as hostile, but what it really is, I think, is an artifact of competition. And Austin's less competitive environment from a funding perspective than, say, the West Coast. I mean, any place on the planet is a less competitive environment than on the West Coast. And so I think the behaviors that investors have are an artifact of that competitive market. Um, I mean, it's a crappy place to be a VC out there because you'll have three term sheets. I mean, there's a one of, one of the guys I started a company with here in town. Um, are we still taping stuff? Um, uh, I, I just made a note to be a little edit. Okay. Do you want me to turn that off? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, there's folks I know. Uh, this guy I started who I started a company with in town. He went out to the West Coast and he started. Uh, he joined a company that um, called Asana. That uh, Dustin Dustin Moskowitz and Justin. Somebody else, the guy who did Gmail. So it's Mark Zuckerberg's roommate and the guy who did Gmail um, started. Uh, so great core team. Um, they had multiple term sheets before they were incorporated. Um, you know, at big valuations, at big amounts of, of, of raise, um, and they didn't they didn't have a name, right? And so that's a that's a tough competitive environment, and, and I don't know whether or not it was ever perceived as hostile, but I'm sure that each one of those people who are trying to get the, that company to take a term, she was like, you know, I don't want you to cross the street, I don't want you to move until you <laughs> sign this thing, and 
you know, what do you, I'll take you out of my boat, buy you dinner, and <laughs> wine you, dine you, what do I have to do? Um, so, um, Austin's different than that. I suspect Boston's different than that. I think uh, New York is getting a little bit more competitive, I think, but. Uh, That's an unusual case to describe it, right? Most people well, this was just a crazy competitive case. Yeah, well, you've named two superstars, but it is not the normal case as it was started as three times. Zero is the normal case. <laughs> For sure. I think, I think, I would say that, yeah, very true. I would say that you statistically average higher on the West Coast. Um, for example, even an early stage company that didn't get into Y Combinator, you know, might have an offer from, you know, two different super angels and Ron Conway kind of super angel. Like, there's still, there's still the possibility of even the great unwashed masses having a little bit more competition out there. Uh, but yeah, for sure, the average case is zero. Um, to add to the leverage question, um, what about having people who can vouch for you? Is that, because like Mark Zuckerberg's roommate, I mean, the fact that he was Mark Zuckerberg, did that have anything to do with him being able to get It started with Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so, so a Facebook you're in Austin. If I have, like, Somebody played me in a movie. Do I get a, can I get a <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> maybe. No, 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 but I'm saying if, if I had that, if that person knew me and could vouch for me, would that add to my ability to negotiate with I'd say I'd say the references and people who can vouch for you are more leverageable in getting introductions yeah. to investors and getting sort of a warm reception where, you know, we hear a hundred potential inbound, you know, uh, calls and emails and pitches and whatever a week and you come in through a reference or somebody we know, the likelihood of you bubbling up to the top is higher. Um, I don't think on the investment per se, it's going to make a tremendous amount of difference. But it might get you hurt. You want him to, he's a perfect person to introduce you to a VC because then they're going to notice. Yeah. So it certainly helps get you that meeting. I think you still then have to go for it and merits of the company and the technology and the team. Something back there? Yeah. It's like percentage wise compared to like the hundreds of calls you get and pitches, like, do you prefer to go like to incubator demo days or like accelerated demo days or do you just kind of like is a percentage of where you invest uh, even? Me personally? Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, no, I, I actually don't, I, I don't like, I like, I think Demo is a great milestone. Uh, I think it's a blip on the spectrum of where you live in a company. I think it's a good point of order relative to getting everything done, kind of probably like the end of the semester. But it is but a but a point you pass through, and so I'd rather get to know a company over some period of time. So, like the value I get out of um, my Capital Factory is the time I get to spend with the team and the company. You know, demo days. By the time demo day comes around, I've already made my decision for sure. Um, that they present well and they're polished and that's all cool. It's like that's awesome. You know. Look at those guys. I knew they were great. Um, but that it is the, the way that I like to bet deals. I, I, I definitely tend to be team oriented. Um, and so that takes a little bit of time to sort of uh, get to know folks. But I want to see the pitch deck. I want to get the market. If it's a market I know, then I can be a little bit more intuitive about it. If it's a market I don't know. We just invested in a um, nanofiber company. Um, and I was like, I, I couldn't spell nanofibers. So I was like, okay, did we start with microfibers and things got smaller? I have no idea what happened. And, uh, uh, so to begin to sort of understand what it was and how it was used and why this was better than that, you know, it was a two week process. I mean, part of what the fun is of, of being in this industry is to learn that kind of stuff. But um, I couldn't even begin to read the pitch until I did that kind of thing. And so it just kind of depends, right? If it's an industry that I know really well, um, and it's a team I, I know really well. I won't even read anything before I meet with those guys. And so um, it kind of depends. I think it really depends on the investor too. So like, um, you know, we, like Kip and I both, if we went to Demo Day and we didn't already know all the companies there, we'd be kind of embarrassed. 
right? Like, we're just, just what we do. Like, we need all these companies really early. We're out looking for them, right? And so it's just like, we're, bef we're, we're before, and we're doing things like Capital Factor and other things to make sure we meet them way before they get the demo day, right? Um, and so, but that, that's the way we are. There's other people where that's their market research. Like, they don't go spending much time doing it. They go to a demo day and they see a bunch of companies, right? For sure. They're, they're a different kind of investor, probably a different stage. A lot of angel investors that aren't as active as probably as somebody like me, that, that, that's a lot of how they might find companies they want to invest in. Is they don't have access to go see them beforehand. They go see them at a demo day. But a lot of the, I, would, I would certainly think a lot of the best investors, they're working hard to find the companies before they get to them. Yeah. Yeah. And guess what that goes back to? Competition, right? Yeah. I mean, not per se, but in general, the people who are like, I go to demo day and I like that. And, yeah, chances are I'm going to be one of six people who like that. And you know, that's just it's an interesting reality. Now, from the company's perspective, that's why you should try incredibly hard to get to in the program to get you a demo day kind of appearance because you get to stack that stuff up. So, my understanding of the Y Combinator demo days is that most of the companies are, are have have a lot have funding by the time demo day comes. Well, don't they have an offer from? Well, and then a separate from that. Yeah, and, yeah. and and then, so what happens is demo days it becomes like the fill-ups around pile on like and that hyper competitive, which again we're, that's what Tim's saying, like a lot of the bargain masters are like, that's I don't want to be there. You know, <laughs> like I'm gonna be before there uh, to, to get in that. But I mean, for your perspective, demo day is just one more way to get in front of more people. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a, I, I talked with uh, one of the co-founders. Well, anyways, I've been told that uh, Sometimes, uh, so like, let's say you got, you know, sand hills, so like your lead, some sand hills is your lead investor, and now there's all these other people trying to pile in, and uh, if they can't spool up money fast enough from their partners, then they might miss the deal. How often does that happen? Any firm that has a, I can't get my money in, thing. You're not getting money from your partners. You've either got a fund that's that, hey. The way I'd play that back is, if they can't make a capital call, which means go to your limiteds and get the next chunk of money in, okay, well, that they're the walking dead. I think it's not <laughs> that they can't make a capital call, but just like the speed, if they're not one of the first people, like, can the round fill up before there's room for other people? Like, you see what I'm saying? It, it like, can, I mean. Does that happen often? Okay. Yeah, it's a, that's a fringy sort of, okay. like, in general, <coughs> If I was going to make an investment in a company, I'd be like, look, here's here's the cap. Here's what I'm investing in. I want to invest this much money at this valuation for this percentage of equity. And if there's, you know, uh, we need to make room for other folks because you want to bring in this angel or you want to go to a demo day and have some room to bring some other folks in, then I'm going to overtly say that it is between zero and this much of the round, and I'm comfortable doing that. It's not a dollar over that. Um, and any of that that doesn't happen, I want. But I'm willing to do that because you want this to happen, and fair enough. But I mean, in that case, there's, there should be zero surprise about who does what, when, and how. Um, it'd be a little bit different if you're doing uh, convertible debt stuff, and you're like, okay, store's open. I'll take 50K chunks. Who wants to go? And you know, that could, I could see that happening, but. That, that seems like a fringe case. Okay. It might be specific to that business model or something. Like that. Well, if you got people clamoring and throw money at you, that's a I mean, good. That's a bad Sounds good to me. So it's ten of nine. Um, I uh, I really appreciate you staying as long as you did. I did not. I, I told him come for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Um, and I'm um, just fun. just because I didn't want to uh, impinge too much on his time. Not only did he come and spend three hours with us. Um, instead of with his two daughters, or at the entrepreneurship, on the poker night going on tonight, or many other things he's probably done. They also brought all the pizza tonight. Um, so we really appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the output of the, the semester? You, is it a, is it, four, you got companies now? We have 20 companies. Okay, and then? We'll be pitching at Demo Day on December 1st. Okay. Okay. I want to I want to invite for that for sure. We are going out today. Uh, Bob, do you have any class comments or anything? For you? So you you're an electrical engineer, and you're at a tipping point. You were the VP of engineering or something like that. CTO. The tipping point? The CEO, but that's it's like the VP of engineering. <laughs> <laughs> the tipping point? The one yeah. we sold the three cup? Yeah. 
You want to CEO that? So how would you learn all this non-electrical engineering stuff? You have to let your entire technical brain atrophy. <laughs> <laughs> Forget everything. Um, um, <laughs> well, you know quite a lot, and we're grateful for your company and receiving and sharing. Yeah, my pleasure. This is, look, I've said for a long time, and, uh, and these guys actually are starting to make it happen, these guys. Um, yeah, we need more interconnectivity between UT and, and the community. So this is the beginning of, you know, I hope 20 companies come out of this. Statistically, that's unlikely. But if, but if like, five great companies come out of this, the good news is that, you know, any one of you could be one of those five. Um, that's huge, it's huge, it's huge for us. Um, we've got so much potential built up in this, this university that we're not getting out there, starting companies, hiring folks, that, no, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm glad you guys are doing it. So, um, Kip at SilvertonPartners.com, you're welcome to email me. Um, I will tend to um, take at least a day to get back, but I will. Um, and so, uh, please email me. I'm now getting pinged officially. Um, and I posted this blog, too, so you got that, too. Yeah, um, and yeah, I'd love to come back and see Demo Day, and if there's anything else in the meantime, email me and I'll, I'll try to get back to you. But thank you for having me, and uh, feel free to have